Ah. Ha ha ha. <clears throat> Four, three, two, one. Boom. Thank you. Thanks for doing this, man. Really appreciate it. Hey, welcome. It's very good to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you, too. And thanks for not lighting this place on fire. You're welcome. <laughs> That's how coming does, later. How does one, um, just in the middle of doing all the things you do, uh, create cars, uh, rockets, all this stuff you're doing, constantly innovating, decide to just make a flamethrower? Where do you have the time for that? Well, the flame, I wouldn't put, wouldn't put a lot of time into the flamethrower. <laughs> the, this was an off-the-cuff thing. And um, so we have, I have sort of like it's sort of a sort of a hobby company called the Boring Company, uh, which started out as a joke, uh, and we decided to make it real, um, and and dig a tunnel under LA, and then dig. Then people, other people, asked us to dig tunnels, and so we said yes in a few cases. <laughs> no, um, who- and, and then and then we have a merchandise section that only has one piece of merchandise at a time and we started off with a cap and there was only one thing on it was just boringcompany.com slash cap or hat that's it and, and then we, we sold the hats limited limited edition it just said the boring company and then I'm a big fan of Spaceballs the movie and in Spaceballs yogurt um, goes through the merchandising section and they have a flamethrower in the merchandising <laughs> section of Spaceballs. And he, like the kids love that one. Uh, that's the line. Uh, when he pulls out the flamethrower, it's like, we should do a flamethrower. So we... Does anybody tell you no? Does anybody go, Elon, um, maybe for yourself, but selling a flamethrower, the liabilities, all the people you're selling this device to, what kind of unhinged people are going to be buying a flamethrower in the first place? Do we really want to connect ourselves to all these potential arsonists? Yeah, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Shouldn't buy one. I, don't, I said don't buy this flamethrower. Don't buy it. <laughs> don't buy it. That's what I said. But still mm. people bought it. Yeah, There's nothing I can do to stop them. It's, you I build it, they will come. I, I, tr- I said don't buy it. It's a bad idea. How many did you make? You w- it's dangerous. It's got. It's wrong. <laughs> Don't buy it. And still, people bought it. I just couldn't stop them. How many did you make? Twenty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all gone. In three, I think four days. <laughs> but it sold out in four days. Whew. Are you going to do a, a an, another run? No. No, that's it. Yes. Oh. I said we would do twenty. We did fifty thousand. Fifty thousand hats. Um. At and and um. That was a million dollars, and he's like, "Okay, we'll we'll sell something and, and f- for ten million, and that was twenty thousand flamethrowers at five hundred dollars each." <laughs> <laughs> they went fast. Yeah, how do you have the time? <laughs> how do you have the time to do that, though? I mean, I understand that it's not a big deal in terms of all the other things that you do, but how do you have time to do anything? I just I don't understand your time management skills. I I mean, I didn't. Spend much time on, on this flamethrower. I mean, to be totally frank, it's actually just a roofing torch with an air rifle cover. It's not a real flamethrower. Which is why it says not a flamethrower. That's why we were very clear. This is not actually a flamethrower. And, and, and also we were told uh, that various countries would, would ban shipping of it. But they, would not, they would ban flamethrowers. So we very, to solve this problem for all the customs agencies, we labeled it not a flamethrower. Did that it way. work? Was it effective? I, I, I don't know. I think so. Yes. So far. Yes. Now, but you do. Because they said you cannot strip a flamethrower. But you do so many different things. Forget about the flamethrower. Like, how do you do all that other shit? Like, how, do you, how, do you, how does one decide to fix L.A. traffic by drilling holes in the ground? And who do you even approach with that? Like, when you have this idea, who do you talk to about that? I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be successful or sort of, you know, I mean, it's just like asserting that it's going to be successful. But so far, I've lived in L.A. for 16 years, and the traffic has always been terrible. Um, and so I don't see any other, like, ideas for improving the traffic. Um, so in desperation, we're going to dig a tunnel, and maybe that tunnel will be successful, and maybe it won't. Um, 
I'm listening. Yeah. I'm not trying to convince you it's going to work. And are the people I that mean, you're, or anyone? But, but you're you were starting this though. This is actually a project you're starting to implement, right? Yeah, yeah. No, we've we've dug um, about a mile. It's quite long. It takes a long time to walk it. Yeah. Now, when you're doing this, what what is the ultimate plan? The ultimate plan is to have these in major cities and anywhere there's mass congestion, and just try it out in LA first. Yeah, it's 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 in LA because uh, I mostly live in LA. That's the reason. It's a terrible place to dig tunnels. This is a, one of the worst places to dig tunnels because the there's mostly because of the paperwork. People think it's like, what about seismic? It's like actually, earth tunnels are very safe in earthquakes. Why is that? Earthquakes are earthquakes are essentially a surface phenomenon. It's like it's like waves on the ocean. So if if, you, if there's a storm, you want to be on the on in a submarine. Mm. So being in a tunnel is like being in a submarine. Now the way the tunnel is constructed is it's constructed out of these interlocking segments, kind of like a snake. Um, it's sort of like a snake exoskeleton uh, with uh, double seals, and so. Even when the ground moves, the it's able to the tunnel actually is able to shift along with the ground, like like an underground snake, and it doesn't crack or break or or and 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 it's extremely unlikely that both seals would be broken. And it's 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 capable of taking five atmospheres of pressure. It's waterproof, methane proof, well gas proof of any kind, and uh, meets all California seismic requirements. So when you have this idea, who do you bring this to? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, when you, you're, you're, you're implementing it, so you're digging holes in the ground. Like yes. You have to bring it to someone that lets you do it. Yeah, so um, there, were, there were some engineers from SpaceX um, who, were, who thought it would be cool to do this. Uh, and the guy who runs it, like, day-to-day, -day, Steve Davis, he's – Longtime SpaceX engineer, he's great. Um, so Steve was like, "I'd like to help make this happen." I was like, "Cool." Um, so we started off with digging a hole in the ground. It's got like a permit for a pit, big pit, and just dug a big pit. And do you have to tell them what the pit's for, or you just say, "Hey, we just want to dig a hole." Nice, fill out this form. <coughs> and That's it. Yeah, it was a pit in our parking lot. And but do you have to give them some sort of a blueprint for your ultimate idea? And do they have to approve it? Like, how does that work? No, we just started off with a pit. Okay. A big pit. And um, uh, you don't. It's not really. You know, they don't really care about the existential nature of a pit. You just say like, I don't want a pit. Right. You know, and uh, it's a hole in the ground. So then we got the permit for the pit, and we dug the pit, and. We dug it in like I don't know three days, two three days. Actually, I think two, 48 hours, something like that. Because um, uh, Eric Garcetti was coming by for the hype to he was going to attend the Hyperloop competition, uh, which is like a student competition we have for uh, who can make the fastest pod in the Hyperloop. And uh, he was coming. This was get, the finals were going to be on Sunday afternoon, and so uh, Eric was coming by on Sunday afternoon. He was like, you know, we should dig this pit and then like show Eric. Uh, so we, this was like Friday morning, and then yeah. So it was about a little over forty hours. Forty hours later, we dug the pit. It was like went twenty four seven, or oh, twenty four, forty eight straight hours, something like that, and dug this big pit, and 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 we like showed Eric the pit. It's like obviously it's just a pit, <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it's <clears throat> hole in the ground is better than no hole in the ground. And what do you tell him about this pit? I mean. You just so said this, this is, is the, the beginning of this idea. Yes. Where we're going to build tunnels under LA to help funnel traffic better, and they go yes. and they just go okay. That but that we we've joked around about this in the podcast before. That like what other person can go to the people that run the city and go hey uh, we're going to dig some holes on the ground and put some tunnels in there, and they go oh yeah okay. Nothing wrong with a hole in the ground. But it's uh, people dig holes in the ground all the time. But but my my question is like I know how much time you must be spending. On your Tesla factory, I know how much time you must be spending on SpaceX, and yet you still have time to dig holes under the ground in LA and come up with these ideas and then implement them. Like, I got a million ideas. I'm sure you do. There's no shortage of that. Yeah. I just don't know how you manage your time. I don't understand it. It doesn't seem. It doesn't even seem humanly possible. 
you know, I, I do basically, I think people like don't totally understand what I do with my time. They think like I'm a business guy or something like that. Um, like my Wikipedia page says business magnate. What would you call yourself? I'm a business magnet. <laughs> <laughs> Can someone please change my Wikipedia page to magnet? They'll change it right now. Please it's probably it already to, changed. It's locked. So somebody has oh. to be able to unlock it and change it to magnet. Someone will get I want that. to be a magnet. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I do engineering and you know and manufacturing and that kind of thing. That's like 80% more of my time. Ideas and then the implementation of those ideas. That's like hardcore engineering, like yeah, designing things, you know. Right. Structural, mechanical, electrical, software, uh, user interface, engineering, aerospace engineering. But you must understand there's not a whole lot of human beings like you. You know that, right? So you're an oddity. Seems, uh, yes. To m chimps like me. We're all chimps. Yeah, we are. We're one, yeah. notch, one notch above a chimp. Some of us are a little bit more confused. When I watch you doing all these things, I'm like, how does this motherfucker have all this time and all this energy and all these ideas, and then people just let him do these things? Because I'm an alien. That's what I've speculated. Yes. I, I'm on record saying this in the past. I wonder. It's true. I mean, if there was one. I was like, if there was like maybe an intelligent being that we created, you know, like some AI creature yeah. that's uh, superior to people. Maybe you just hang around with us for a little while like you've been doing and then fix a bunch of shit. Maybe that's the way. I might have some <laughs> mutation or something like that. You might. Do you think you do? Probably. Do you wonder? Like, are you around normal people? You're like, hmm. You're like, what's up with these boring, dumb motherfuckers? Ever? Not bad for a human. But I, I think we'll not be able to hold a candle to AI. Hmm. You scare the shit out of me when you talk about AI. Between you and Sam Harris. Oh, I didn't sure. even consider it until I had a podcast with Sam once. That's and great. He made me shit my pants. <sighs> I, I, talking about AI, I, I realized, like, oh, well, this is a genie that once it's out of the bottle, you're never getting it back in. That's true. There was a video that you tweeted about one of those Boston Dynamic robots. And yeah. you're like, in the future, it'll be moving so fast you can't see it without a strobe light. Yeah. You could probably do that right now. And no one's really uh, paying attention too much other than people like you or people that are really obsessed with technology. All these things in, are happening and these robots are... And did you see the one where P PETA uh, put out a statement that you shouldn't kick robots? It's probably not wise. <laughs> For retribution. Their, their memory is very good. I bet it's really good. It's really good. I bet it is. Yes. And getting better every day. It's really good. Are you honestly legitimately concerned about this? Are you is like AI one of your main worries in regards to the future? It, yes, it it's less of a worry than it used to be, uh mostly due to taking more of a fatalistic attitude. Hmm. So you used to have more hope, and you gave up some of it, and now you don't worry as much about AI. You're like, this is just what it is. Yeah, pretty much. Yes. Hmm. Yes. yes no, not, it's, it's, but no, it's not necessarily bad. It's just, it's definitely going to be outside of human control. Not necessarily bad, right? Yes. Yeah, it's, not, it's not necessarily bad. It's just... It's just outside of human control. Now, the thing that's going to be tricky here is that it's going to be very tempting to use AI as a weapon. It's going to be very tempting. In fact, it will be used as a weapon. Um, so the, 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 the on-ramp to serious AI, the danger is going to be more humans using it against each other, I think, most likely. That'll be the danger. Yeah. How far do you think we are from something that can make its own mind up, whether or not something's ethically or morally correct, or whether or not it wants to do something, or whether or not it wants to improve itself, or whether or not it, it wants to protect itself from people or from other AI? How far away are we some, from something that's really, truly sentient? Well, I mean, you could argue that any group of people like like a, a company 
is essentially a, a cybernetic collective of people and machines. That's what a company is. And then there are different, there's different levels of complexity in the way these companies are formed. And then there are sort of, there's this sort of like a collective AI in, in the Google sort of search, Google search, you know, the, where we're all sort of plugged in as like, like nodes on the network, like leaves on a big tree. All f and we're all, we're all feeding this network with our questions and answers. We're all collectively programming the AI. And, the, the, and Google plus the, all the humans that connect to it are one giant cybernetic collective. This is also true of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these social networks. They're giant cybernetic collectives. It'll humans and electronics all interfacing and constantly now, constantly connected. Yes, constantly. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot over the last few years is that one of the, th the things that drives a lot of people crazy is how, how many people are obsessed with materialism and getting the latest, greatest thing. And I wonder how much of that is, well, a lot of it is most certainly fueling technology and innovation. And it almost seems like it's built into us. It's so like what we like and what we want, that we're fueling this thing that's constantly around us all the time. And it doesn't seem possible that people are going to pump the brakes. It doesn't seem possible at this stage where we're constantly expecting the newest cell phone, the latest Tesla update, the newest MacBook Pro. We're, we're, everything has to be newer and better. And that's going to lead to some I incredible point. And it, it seems like it's built into us. It almost seems like it's a, an instinct that we, we're working towards this, that we like it. Mm -hmm. That Our job, just like the ants build the ant hill, our job is to somehow or another fuel this. Yes. Um, I mean, when I made this comment some, some years ago, but it feels like we are the biological bootloader for AI, effectively. We are building it. And then we're building progressively greater intelligence and the percentage of intelligence that is not human is increasing. And eventually, we will represent a very small percentage of intelligence. But the, the AI is informed, strangely, by the human limbic system. It, it is, in large part, our id writ large. How so? Well, you mentioned all those things. The sort of primal drives. Mm -hmm. um, there's all, all the things that we like and hate and fear. They're all there on the internet. They're, they're a projection of our limbic system. <laughs> it's true. Hey, no, it makes sense. And the thinking of it as a I mean, think of thinking of corporations and just thinking of just human beings communicating online through these social media networks as some sort of an organism that's a, it's a cyborg. It's a, it's a combination. It's a combination of electronics and biology. Yeah. This is... In, in, some, in some measure, like, it's the, the success of these online systems is, the, is, a, is sort of a function of, of how much limbic resonance they're able to achieve with people. The more limbic resonance, the more engagement. Mm. Whereas like, one of the reasons why probably Instagram is more enticing than Twitter. Limbic resonance. Yeah, you get more images, more video. Yes. It's tweaking your system more. Yes. Do you worry about, or wonder, in fact, about what the next step is? I mean, a lot of people didn't see Twitter coming that, you know, communicate with 140 characters or 280 now would be a thing that people would be interested in. Like, it's going to excel. It's going to become more connected to us, right? Yes, things are getting more and more connected. They're, at this point, constrained by bandwidth. Our input-output is slow. 
particularly output. Output got worse with thumbs. You know, we used to have input with 10, 10 fingers, now we have thumbs. But I images are just are also are there a way of communicating at high bandwidth. You take pictures and you send pictures to people. What sends that's that communicates far more information than you can communicate with your thumbs. So what happened with you where you decided or you be, took on a more fatalistic attitude? Like what was there any specific thing or was it just the inevitability of our future? I try to convince people to slow down, slow down AI, to regulate AI. This was futile. I tried for years. This seems Nobody like a listened. scene in a movie Nobody where listened. the robots are going to fucking take over and you're freaking me out. Nobody listened. Nobody listened. No one. Are people more inclined to listen today? It seems like an issue that's brought up more often over the last few years than it was maybe five, ten years ago. It seemed like science fiction. Maybe they will. So far, they haven't. I think people don't, like, the, normally the way that regulations work is very slow. It's very slow indeed. So, usually there'll be something, some new technology. It will cause damage or death. There will be an outcry. There will be an investigation. Years will pass. There will be some sort of insight committee. There will be rulemaking. Then there will be oversight, eventually regulations. This all takes many years. This is the normal course of things. If you look at, say, automotive regulations, how long did it take for seat belts to be, to be implemented, to be required? You know, the auto industry fought seat belts, I think, for more than a decade, successfully fought any regulations on seat belts, even though the numbers were extremely obvious. If you had a seat belt on, you would be far less likely to die or be seriously injured. It was unequivocal. And the industry fought this for years successfully. Eventually, after many, many people died, regulators insisted on seat belts. Oof. This is a. This time frame is not relevant to AI. You can't take ten years from the point at which it's dangerous. It's too late. And you feel like this is decades away or years away from being too late. If you have this fatalistic attitude, and you yeah. feel like it's going, we're in a almost like a doomsday countdown. It's not necessarily a doomsday countdown. It's it's a out of control countdown. Out of control. Yeah, people call it the singularity, and uh, that's that's probably a good way to think about it. It's, it's a singularity. It's hard to predict, like a black hole, what what happens past the event horizon. Right. It's so once it's implemented, it's very different because it it will once be the able to out of the bottle. What's right. going to happen? And it will be able to improve itself. Pro yes. That's where it gets spooky, right? The idea that it can do thousands of years of innovation very, very quickly. Yeah. And then we'll be just ridiculous. Ridiculous. We will be like this ridiculous biological shitting, pissing thing trying to stop the gods. No, stop. We like, we like living with a finite lifespan and, and watching you know, Norman Rockwell paintings. It could be terrible and it could be great. It's not clear. Right. But one thing is... For sure, we will not control it. Do you think that it's likely that we will merge somehow or another with this sort of technology and it'll augment what we are now? Or do you think it will s replace us? Well, that's the scenario. The, 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 the merge scenario with AI is the one that seems like probably the best. Like For if, us. Yes. Like if you if you can't beat it, join it. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, so, from a long term existential standpoint, that's like the purpose of Neuralink is to create a high bandwidth interface 
to the brain such that we can be symbiotic with AI. Because we have a bandwidth problem. You just can't communicate through your fingers. It's too slow. And where's Neuralink at right now? I think we'll have something interesting to announce in a few months. That's at least an order of magnitude better than anything else. Probably, I think better than probably anyone thinks is possible. How much can you talk about that right now? I don't want to jump the gun on that. Um, but what's like the ultimate, what's, what's the idea behind it? Like what are you trying to accomplish with it? Like what would you like, best case scenario? I think best case scenario, we effectively merge with AI uh, where we, AI serves as a tertiary cognition layer uh, where we've got the limbic system, um, kind of the you know, primitive brain, essentially. You've got the cortex. So you're, you're currently in a symbiotic relationship. Your, your cortex and limbic system are in a symbiotic relationship. And generally, people like their cortex, and they like their limbic system. I haven't met anyone who wants to delete their limbic system or delete their cortex. Everybody seems to like both. And the cortex is mostly in service to the limbic system. People may think that 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 their that the thinking part of themselves is in charge, but it's mostly their limbic system that's in charge, and the cortex is trying to make the limbic system happy. That's what most of that computing power is oriented towards. How can I make the limbic system happy? That's what it's trying to do. Now, if, if we do have a third layer, which is the AI extension of yourself, that is also symbiotic. Um, and there's enough bandwidth between the cortex and the AI extension of yourself such that the AI doesn't de, de facto separate, then that could be a good outcome. That could be quite a positive outcome for the future. So instead of replacing us, it will radically change our capabilities. Yes. It will, it will enable anyone who wants to have superhuman Cognition. Anyone who wants. This is not a matter of earning power because your earning power would be vastly greater after you do it. So it's just like anyone who wants can just do it in theory. That's the theory. And, and if that's the case, then, and let's say billions of people do it, then the outcome for humanity will be the sum of of human will, the sum of billions of people's desire for the future. And but that, that billions could be a, of people with enhanced cognitive ability, radically yes, enhanced. Yes. And th which would be, it, how much different than people today? Like if you if you had to explain it to a, a person who didn't really know, understand what you're saying, like how much different are you talking about? When you say radically improved, like what do you mean? You mean mind reading? It would be difficult, it would be difficult to, to really appreciate the, dif the difference. Um, you know, it's kind of like how much smarter are you with a phone or computer than without? It's, you're vastly smarter, actually. You know, you can answer any question. If you're, if you're connected to the Internet, you can answer any question pretty much instantly, any calculation. Uh, the, the, your phone's memory is essentially perfect. Uh, you can remember flawlessly. Your, f your phone can remember videos, pictures, any, everything perfectly. Uh, that's the, that your phone is already an extension of you. You're already a cyborg. You don't even, well, most people don't realize they are already a cyborg. It, that phone is an extension of yourself. It's just that the, the data rate, the rate at which of the communication rate between you and the cybernetic extension of yourself that is your phone and computer is slow. It's very slow. And, and that, that, that it's like a tiny straw of, of, of information flow between your biological self and your digital self. And we need to make that tiny straw like a giant river, huge, high bandwidth interface. It's an interface problem, data rate problem. If you solve the data rate problem, then I think, I think we can hang on to human machine symbiosis through the long term. 
And then people may decide that they want to retain their biological self or not. I think they'll probably choose to retain their bi biological self. Versus some sort of Ray Kurzweil scenario where they download themselves into a computer? You will be essentially snapshotted into a computer at any time. If your biological self dies, you could just probably just upload into a new unit. Literally. Pass that whiskey. <laughs> this is, we're getting crazy over here. This is getting <laughs> ridiculous. Can Down the rabbit that? hole. Grab that sucker. Give me some of that. <laughs> this is too freaky. <laughs> See, if I've I was been thinking about this for a long friend, time, by the way. I believe you have. If I was talking to one of my... Cheers, by the way. Cheers. Yeah, this is a great whiskey. Thank you. I don't know where this came from. Who brought this to us? I'm trying to remember. I Somebody can't. gave it yeah. to us. Yeah. Old Camp, whoever it was. Thanks. It's good. Yeah, it is good. Um, this is just inevitable. Again, going back to your when you decided to be, have this fatalistic viewpoint. So you warn, you tried to warn people. You talked about this... Pretty extensively. I've read several interviews mm -hmm. where you talked about this, and then you just sort of just said, "Okay, it just is." Well, it's just, and you, in a way, you're by communicating the, the potential fear. I mean, it, for sure, you're you're getting the warning out to some people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was really going on the warning quite quite a lot. I was warning everyone I could. You ever met with Obama, and just for one reason, like just to watch talk out. about AI. Yes. And what did he say? He said, "What about Hillary? <laughs> Worry about her first. Shh, everybody be quiet." No, he he listened. <laughs> he certainly listened. Um, I met with Congress. I met with. I, I was at a meeting of all fifty governors, and talked about just AI danger, and I talked to everyone I could. No one seemed to realize where this was going. Is it that, or do they just assume that someone smarter than them is already taking care of it? Because when, when people hear about something like AI, it's almost abstract. It's almost, it's almost like it's so, it's so hard to wrap your head around it. it By is. the time it already happens, it'll be too late. Yeah. I think they didn't quite understand it or didn't think it was near term or... Not sure what to do about it. When I said, like, you know, an obvious thing to do is to just establish a, a committee, government committee, to gain insight, you know, before before you do oversight, before you do make regulations, you should, like, try to understand what's going on. Um, and then if you have an insight committee, then the once they learn what's going on, get up to speed, then they can make maybe some rules or propose some rules. And, and that would be probably a safer way to go about things. It seems, I mean, I, I know that it's probably something that the government's supposed to handle, but it seems like I wouldn't want the, I don't want the government to handle this. Who do you want to handle I want it? you to handle this. Oh, geez. Yeah. I feel like you're the one who could ring the bell better. Because if, if Mike Pence starts talking about AI, I'm like, shut up, bitch. You don't know anything about AI. Come on, man. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, but I don't demons. have the power to regulate other companies. <laughs> what am I supposed to? I, like, right. Like, but you know. maybe companies could agree. Maybe there could be some huh. sort of a – I mean, there's – we have agreements where you're not supposed to dump toxic waste into the ocean. You're not supposed to do certain things that could be terribly damaging even though they'd be profitable. Maybe this is one of those things. Maybe we should realize that you can't hit the switch on something that's going to be able to think for itself and make up its own mind as to whether or not it wants to survive or not and whether or not it thinks you're a threat. And whether or not it thinks you're useless. Like, why do I keep this dumb, finite life form alive? Why, why keep this thing around? It's just stupid. It just keeps polluting everything and shitting <laughs> everywhere it goes, lighting everything on fire and shooting each other. Why would I keep this stupid thing alive? Because sometimes it makes good music, you know? Sometimes it makes great movies. Sometimes it makes beautiful art. And sometimes, it, you know, sometimes it's cool to hang out with. <laughs> Like yes, might, all those reasons. Yeah, for us, those are great reasons. Yes. But for anything objective, standing outside, like, oh, this is definitely a flawed system. This is like if you went to the jungle and you watched these chimps engage in warfare and beat each other over the head with mean. sticks. They're fucking real They're mean. They're fucking mean. They're real mean. I saw that movie Chimpanzee. I thought it was going to be like some Disney thing. I was like, holy cow. What movie was that? It's literally called Chimpanzee. Who, is it a documentary? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a documentary. I was like, damn, these chimps are mean. They're mean. Yeah. yeah. They're cruel. Yeah, they're, they're, they're calculated. Yeah. Yeah. They sneak up on each other and... 
like I didn't realize chimps did calculated cruelty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's pretty. Ah, I left that meeting kind of thinking, "Whoa, this is dark." Right. Well, we know better because we've advanced. <laughs> but if we hadn't, we'd be like, "Man, I don't want to fucking live in a house. I like the chimp ways, bro. Chimp ways to go. This is it, man. Chimp life. It's the only <laughs> like chimp I, life. It's the only life I know." But we, in a way, to the AI, might be like those chimps. We're like, these stupid fucks launching missiles out of drones and shooting each other underwater. Like, we're crazy. We got torpedoes and submarines and fucking airplanes that drop nuclear bombs indiscriminately on cities. We're assholes. (laughs) Yeah. They might go, why are they doing this? It might, like, look at our politics Look at what we do in terms of our, our, our food system, what, what kind of food we force down each other's throats. And they might go, these, these people are crazy. They don't even look out for themselves. I don't know. I mean, like, how much do we think about chimps? Not much. Very little. It's like it's and true. The, these chimps are at war. They, right. These like little, it's like groups of chimps just attack each other and they kill each other and they torture each other. That's pretty bad. Um, they hunt monkeys. Uh, they're, but like, this is probably the most that, you know, I mean, when's the last time you talk about chimps? Like, Me? Yeah. All the time. You do? Talking to the okay, wrong well, guy. Nah, this fucking okay. podcast. Dude, I it's talk chi- about chimps chimp every city? other episode. Okay. <laughs> People are laughing right now. Yeah. Constantly. Okay. I'm obsessed. I saw that David Attenborough documentary on chimps where they were eating those colobus monkeys and ripping them yeah. apart. It's just rough. I saw that it's many, gr- many years gruesome. ago. It just gruesome. changed how I, th- I go, oh, this is why people are so crazy. We came from that thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or I mean, there's the bonobos. Thing. Yeah. They got a like better philosophy. Yeah, they're like swingers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> they 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 seem to be way more even than us, way more civilized. <laughs> they just seem to resolve everything with sex. Yeah. The only rules they have is the mom won't bang the son. That's it. Okay. That's it. Mom won't bang her sons. They're good women. Yeah. Good women in the bonobo community. Everybody else just banging it out. Yeah. I haven't seen the bonobo movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're disturbing just at a zoo. You know, you have bonobos at the zoo. They're just it's, constantly going. They're constantly fucking, yeah. <laughs> like, that's all they, they do. just won't stop. Yeah, and they don't care. Gay, straight, whatever. Let's just fuck. <laughs> What's with these labels? <laughs> I haven't seen bonobos at a zoo. It's probably like I don't think not, in the, not in the PG section. Yeah, I don't think they have them at many zoos. We've looked that up before <laughs> yeah, too. It's didn't probably they? pretty awkward. Yeah. I think that's the thing. They like to keep regular chimps at zoos because bonobos are just always jacking off. And <laughs> yeah. Fucking. A, what's that? They have in San Diego. San Diego's just got some. Yeah. Really interesting. Probably separate okay. them. Yeah. I mean, I mean, how many other in a cage? You know, it's like right. It's gonna be pretty intense. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, we're we're a weird thing, you know, and I've often wondered if whether or not we're, you know, our ultimate goal is to give birth to some new thing. And that that's why we're so obsessed with technology. Because it's not like this technology is really I mean, it's certainly enhancing our lives to in a certain way, but is I mean, ultimately is it making people happier right now? Most technology I would say no. In fact, you and I were talking about social media before this about just not having Instagram on your phone and not dealing and you mm-hmm. feel better. Yes, I think that one of the issues with social media that's been pointed out by many people is that um, I think maybe particularly Instagram, um, people look like they have a much better life than they really do. Right, So by design. Yeah, people are posting pictures of when they're really happy they're modifying those pictures to be better looking. Um, even if they're not modifying the pictures, they're at least selecting the pictures for the best lighting, the best angle. Um, so people basically seem uh, uh, they're way better looking than they basically really are. Right. Um, and they're way happier seeming than they really are. So if you look at everyone on Instagram, you might think, man, there are all these happy, beautiful people. and I'm not that good looking and I'm not happy. So I must suck, you know, and that's going to make people sad. So when in fact, those people you think are super happy, actually not that happy. Some of them are really depressed. They're very sad. Some of the happiest seeming people, actually some of the saddest people in reality. Um, and, and, and nobody looks good all the time. It doesn't matter who you are. No. 
it's not even something you should want. Why do you yeah. want to look great all the time? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I think I think things like that can make people quite sad. Well, you um, just just by comparison, because you you just sort of you, you people people generally think of themselves relative to to others. It's it's a we are constantly re re baselining our expectations. Um, and you can see this, say, if you watch some show like Naked and Afraid or, you know, if you just <laughs> go and try living in the woods by yourself for a while and you're like, you'll learn that civilization is quite great. It has a lot, it's a lot of it. It's, people want to come back to civilization pretty fast on Naked what, and Afraid. Wasn't that a Thoreau quote? The comparison is a thief of joy? Yeah. Well, happiness is reality minus expectations. <laughs> That's great, too. But the comparison is a thief of joy really holds true to people. Is it? Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, in, when you're thinking about Instagram, because what essentially Instagram is with a lot of people is you're giving them the opportunity to be their own PR agent, and they always go towards the glamorous. Mm -hmm. you know? And when any, anybody does show, you know, hashtag no filter, you <laughs> know, if they, if they really do do that. Like, oh, you're so brave. Look at you. No makeup. You know, Bitch, yeah. they look good anyway. You look great. What are you doing? Oh my God, you don't have makeup on. You still look hot as fuck. You know what you're doing. I know what you're doing too. They're 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 letting you know, and then they're feeding off that comment section. Ooh, just a little <laughs> sitting there like like it's a, a fresh stream of love. Like you're getting right up to the source as it comes out of the earth, and you're sucking that a lot sweet, of, lot of sweet emojis. love water. It's emojis, emojis. Yeah, a lot of Weird. emojis. My my concern is not so much what Instagram is. Is that I didn't think that people had the need for this or the expectation for some sort of technology that allows them to constantly get love and adulation from strangers and comments and, and this ability to project this sort of distorted version of who you really are. But I worry about where it goes. Like, what's the next one? What's the next one? Like, where is it? Is it going to be augmented? Is some sort of a weird augmented or virtual sort of Instagram type situation? Where you're not going to want to live in this real world, you're going to want to interface with this sort of world that you've created through your social media page. It's some next level thing. It's yeah, a, go live in the simulation. Yeah, I mean, it, in the simulation, some Ready Player One type shit that's real. That seems we have that HTC Vive here, and pff, I've only done it a couple times, quite honestly, because it kind of freaks me out. Sure, my kids fucking love it, man. They love it. They love playing these weirdo games and, and, and walking around with that headset on. But part of me watching them do it goes, wow, I wonder if this is like the precursor. Just sort of like if you look at that, that phone that Gordon Gecko had on the beach. Yes. And then you compare the big that. Cell phone. Yeah, you compare that to like a Galaxy Note 9. Like sure. how the fuck did that become that, right? And I wonder when I see this yes. HTC Vive, I'm like, what is that thing going to be 10 years from now when we're making fun of what it is now? What is it? How I mean, how ingrained and how 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 connected and interconnected is this technology going to be in our life? It will be at some point indistinguishable from reality. Where we'll lose this, we'll lose this. Like you and I are just looking at each other through our eyes. I see are you. We? You see me. I think. I hope. You think so? I think you probably have regular eyes. This could be some simulation. It could. Do you entertain that? Well, the argument for the simulation, I think, is quite strong. Because if you assume any improvement at all over time, any improvement, 1%, 0.1%, just extend the time frame, make it 1,000 years, a million years. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. What would a what, civilization, if you count it if you're very generous, civilization is maybe seven or 8,000 years old, if you count it from the first writing. This is nothing. This is nothing. Um, so if you assume any rate of improvement at all, then games will be indistinguishable from reality. Or civilization will end. One of those two things will occur. Therefore, Ultimately. we are most likely in a simulation. Or Good. we're on our we way exist. to one, right? Well, but just because we exist, we, exist we, we could most we, certainly be on the road. We could be on the road to that, right? It doesn't mean that it has to have already happened. We could be in base reality. We could be in base reality. We could be here now on our way to the road 
or on our way to the destination where this can never happen again, where we are completely ingrained in some sort of an artificial technology or some sort of a symbiotic relationship with the internet or the next level of uh, sharing information. But right now we're not there yet. That's possible too, right? It's possible that a simulation is one day going to be inevitable, that we're going to have something that's indistinguishable from regular reality. But maybe we're not there yet. That's also possible. That we're not yes, quite there yet. That this is real? When I touch that it feels wood, very real. Maybe that's why everybody's like into like mason jars and shit. Mason jars. Suede shoes. People are into like craft restaurants and they, they want raw wood. Everyone wants, to see, everyone wants to see metal. People, it seems like people are like longing towards some weird log cabin type nostalgia. Sure. Reality. Yeah, like holding on, like clinging, just sure. dragging their nails through the mud. Like, don't take me yet. Yes. I want to. But, but then, but then people will go get a mason jar with a wine stem or a handle. That's dark. Mason Makes me jam- lose faith in humanity. Wine stem and a handle. Do they have those. Yes. Oh, those dirty people. Oh, That's just terrible. assholes. That's like people make pet rocks. Rough. Right? This is, some people are just assholes. They take advantage of our, our, our generous nature. It was made with a wine stem, made with a handle. They made it that way. Yes. So the, the, it wasn't it was like they welded like it that. onto the mason Ah, oh, you no, fucks. That would be fine if there was, they glued it on or something. But right. It was, made, like it was made that way. White trash chic. Oh, this is disgusting. Yes. Look at this. Here it is right harsh. there. Yep. This is terrible. Yeah. That's like... Fake breasts that are designed to be hard, like fake breasts from the 60s. <laughs> it's like if you really long for the ones with ripples, here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's almost what that is. Yeah. What are you going to do, man? There's not, nothing, you know, it's not you can do stop certain terrible ideas from propagating. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I, I don't want to sound like, like things are too dark because I think like you, you kind of have to be optimistic about the future. There's no point in being pessimistic. It's just too negative. It like, doesn't help. No, it doesn't help. You know, I think you want to be – I mean, my theory is like you'd rather be optimistic. I think I'd rather, I'd rather be optimistic and wrong than pessimistic and right. Right. Or at least or on that side. Right. Yeah. Because if, if you're pessimistic, you're just going to be miserable. Yeah. Yeah, nobody wants to be around you anyway. If it's the end of the world, you're like, I fucking told you, bro. Yeah. The world's exactly. ending. Yeah. It is I what mean, it is for well all. I mean, enjoy the journey. Right. If you really want to get morose, I mean, it is what it is for all of us anyway. We, we're all going to go, unless some something changes. Yeah. In a, I, I mean, ultimately, you know, even if we just sort of existed as humans, Forever, we'd be, we'd still eventually, that'd be like the heat death of the universe. Right. A zillion years from now. Right. Um, Even if we get it past the sun. If we figure out a way past the sun running out of juice. Eventually, it's going to end. It's just a question of when. Right. So it really is all about the journey. Hmm. Or transcendence from whatever we are now into something that doesn't worry about death. The universe as we know it will dissipate into a fine mist of cold nothingness eventually. And then someone's going to bottle it and put a fragrance to it, sell it to French people in another dimension. <laughs> it's just a very long time. So yeah. I think it's really just about how can we make it last longer? Are you a, a proponent of the multi-universes theory? Do you believe that there are many, many universes and that even if this one fades out, that there's other ones that are starting fresh right now and there's an infinite number of them? And they're just constantly in this never-ending cycle of birth and death? I think most likely, this is just about probability, there are many, many simulations. These simulations are, you might as well call them reality, or you could call them the multiverse. These simulations, you believe, are created? Like someone has manufactured? They're running on the substrate. So? That substrate is probably boring. Boring? Mm Mm-hmm. How so? Well, when we create a simulation, like a game or a movie, it's the distillation of what's interesting about life. You know, like it, it takes, it can take a year to shoot an action movie. And then that's all distilled down into two or three hours. So let me tell you, if you see an action movie being filmed, it's friggin' it's boring, super boring. It takes 
there's like lots of takes. There's everything's in a green screen. Looks pretty goofy. Doesn't look cool. <laughs> but once you add the CGI it's, and have great editing, it's amazing. So I think most likely, if we're a simulation, it's really boring outside the simulation. Because why would you make a simulation that's boring? It makes simulation way more interesting than base reality. Th that is if this right now is a simulation. Yes. And ultimately, inevitably, we're, if, as long as we don't die or get hit by a meteor, we're going to create some sort of simulation if we continue on the same technological path we're on, we're on right now. Yes. But we might not be there yet. So it might not be a simulation here. But it most likely is, you feel, other places. <laughs> This notion of place or where is mm. is a flawed. Yes, flawed like perception. Where, like right. that, if you have this sort of that uh, Vive, you mm -hmm. know, which with a that's made by Valve and Steam and H it's really Valve that made it. HTC did the hardware, but it's really a Valve thing. Um, Makers of Half Life. Yes, <laughs> Valve, great company. Great company. Um, <laughs> Uh, when you're in that in that some in that virtual reality, which is only going to get better, where are you? Where are you really? Right. You aren't anywhere. Well, where is? You're in the computer. What what you know? What defines where you are? Is exactly it, right. It's your perception. Is it per your perceptions, or is it you know a scale that we have under your butt? You're what right here. I've measured you. You're the same weight as you were when you left. Like, but you, meanwhile, your experience. Why is do you think different. you're where you are right now? You might not be. I'll spark up a joint if you keep talking. <laughs> your manager's gonna come in here. We might have to lock the door. Right now, you think you're in a studio in LA. That's what I heard. You might be in a computer. Oh, listen, man, I think about this all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's unquestionable that one day that'll be the case, as long as we keep going, as long as nothing interrupts us, and if we start from scratch. And, you know, we're single-celled organisms all over again. And then millions and millions of years later, we become the next thing that is us with creativity and the ability to change its environment. It's going to keep monkeying with things until it figures out a way to change reality, to change, I mean, to almost like punch a hole through what is this thing into what, what it wants it to be and create new things. And then those new things will intersect with other people's new things, and then it will be this ultimate pathway of infinite ideas and expression all through technology. Yeah. And then we're wonder we're gonna wonder, like, why are we here? What are we doing? Let's find out. <laughs> well I, th I, th I mean I think we should take the actions the set of actions that are most likely to make the future better. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And then reevaluate those actions to make sure they're or that it's true. Well, I think there's a movement to that. I mean, in terms of like a social movement, I think some of it's misguided and some of it's exaggerated and there's a lot of a lot of people that are fighting for their side out there, but it seems like the general trend of like uh social awareness seems to be much more heightened now than has ever been in any other time in history because of our ability to express ourselves instantaneously to each other through Facebook or Twitter or what have you. And that the trend is to uh, abandon preconceived notions, abandon prejudice, abandon discrimination, and promote kindness and happiness as much as possible. You looking at this knife? Somebody gave it to me. Sorry. Yeah, Donnie what is Vincent. this? What the fuck did you do? Uh, my friend Donnie, he brought this with him and it just stayed here. I have a real samurai sword. If you want to play with that, I know you're into weapons. That's from the 1500s. Samurai really? sword at the end of the table. Yeah, oh, that's cool. I'll grab it. Hold on. Yeah, that's a legit samurai sword from an actual samurai from the 1500s. If you pull out that blade, that blade was made the old way where uh, a master folded craftsman folded that metal and hammered it down over and over again over a long period of time and honed that blade into what it is now. What's crazy is that more than 500 years later, that thing is still pristine. I mean, whoever 
took care of that and passed it down to the next person who took care of it and, and you know, until it got to the podcast room. It's pretty fucking crazy. Yeah. One day someone's going to be looking at a Tesla like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. These fucking back doors, they pop up sideways like a Lamborghini. <laughs> you should see what a Tesla can do. Uh, you didn't, you should, I'll show you afterwards. Well, I've driven one. I love them. Yeah, but most people don't know what it can do. In terms of like ludicrous mode? In terms of like driving super fast and irresponsibly on public roads? Is that what you're saying? Well, any car can do that. Yeah. What can it do that that I need to know about? I mean, the Model X can do this like ballet thing to the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. It's pretty cool. Where it dances? Yes. Legitimately? Like mm-hmm. it moves around? Yes. Why would you program that into a car? <laughs> Seemed like fun. <laughs> That's what I get about you. That's what's weird. Like when you showed up here, you were all smiles, and you pull out a fucking blowtorch and not a blowtorch. But I'm like, look not at this dude. Not a flamethrower. Not a flamethrower. I'm like, he's I having be clear, fun. It's definitely not a flamethrower. But you're, you're having fun. Like this is uh, like this thing when you know you program a car to do a ballet dance. It's you're great. having fun. How do you have the time to do that? I don't understand. Why you're digging holes under the earth and sending rockets into space and, and, and powering people in Australia. Like, how the fuck do you have time to make the car dance ballet? Well, I mean, in that case, there were some engineers at Tesla that said, you know, what if we make this car dance and play music? I was like, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Please do it. <laughs> Let's try to get it done in time for Christmas. We did. did you, is there a concern about someone just losing their mind and making it do that on the highway? No, it won't do that. What if it's in bumper-to-bumper traffic? Nope. No, won't do it. Nope. It's actually, you have to. it's an Easter egg. Oh, it's an Easter egg. Yeah, that's why people don't know about it, including people who have the car. <sighs> well, it's like, it can do lots of things, lots of things. Once Reddit gets a hold of it. Everyone's going oh, to you know just that. have to, it's everyone, <laughs> if you search for it on the internet, you, you will find, find out, it. but people don't know that they should even search for it. Oh, well, they do now. Yes. Yes. There's so many things about the but Model if, X and the Model S and the Model 3 that people don't know about. We should probably do a video or something and explain it, because I have close friends of mine, and I say, do you know the car can do this? And they're like, Nope. Do you want to do a video of that, or do you like the fact that some people don't know? No, I think it's probably not. We should tell people. Yeah, probably. Yes. That would help your product. I mean, it's not like you don't sell enough of them. You sell almost too many of them, right? The, I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's meant to be. Well... Our goal is to make it's it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. Mm. Make it's maximum fun. Okay. Electronic like big screen, laptop, ridiculous speed, handling, all that stuff. Yeah. Do you you have And a, we're going to put video games in it. You are? Yeah. Is that wise? Well, what kind you, of video you won't be able to Candy drive crush? while you're playing the video game. But we're like, oh. for example, we just, like we're just putting the, the, the Atari emulator, ROM emulator in it. Mm. So you'll be able to play Missile Command and Lunar Lander and a bunch of other things. Ooh. Yeah. That sounds cool. It's pretty fun. I like that. Yeah. And we improved the interface of Missile Command because it was too hard with the old trackball. So this is, this is a touchscreen version of Missile Command. <laughs> so you have a chance. <laughs> Do you you have an old car, don't you? Don't you have like an old Jaguar? Yeah, how do you yeah. know that? That's that's most people know that. I have a '61 Series One E-Type Jaguar. I love cars. It's great. Yeah, I love old cars. Uh, that's the, one of the things. Only, that... Yeah, the only two ga- the only two gasoline cars I have are that and an old like a Ford Model T that a friend of mine gave me. Mm, that's that's... Those, my only two gasoline cars. Is the Ford Model T all stock? Well, oh, there's your car. Ooh, look I at that. I have the convertible. That is a gorgeous car. God, that's a good looking car. Yes. Is that yours? <laughs> that is. Is it's that not it? mine. It's extremely Seemly close to mine. But I don't have a French license plate on mine. Oh, that's a beautiful car. 
They nailed that's, that. That's that mine looks type. like that. God, they nailed that. That's what mine looks like. Maybe that is mine. There's certain iconic shapes. Yes. And th there's there's something about those cars too. They're not as capable, not nearly as capable as like a Tesla, but there's something really satisfying about the mechanical aspect of like feeling the steering and the, the yeah. grinding of the gears and the shifting. There's something about those that's extremely satisfying, even though they're not that competent. Like I have a uh, 1993 Porsche 964. It's like a lightweight. It's not it's in the RS America. It's not very fast. It's not like in comparison to a Tesla or anything like that. But the thing about it is like it's mechanical. Mm -hmm. You feel it. Everything's like. <laughs> it's sure. like it gives you this weird thrill like you're on this clinky ride and there's all this feedback. And there's something to that. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. My, my E-Type is like basically no electronics. Yeah. Um, it's so just, you like that, but you also like electronics. Yes. Like your uh, Tesla soup, it's like the far end of yeah. electronics. Yes. It drives itself. It's driving itself better every day. Yeah. Uh, it's like uh, we're about to release the software that will enable you to just turn it on and it'll drive from highway on ramp to highway exit, do lane changes, to overtake other cars, to Jesus. go from one interchange to the next. If you get on, say, the 405, and get off, get off 300 miles later, and go through several highway interchanges, and just take, overtake other cars, and hook into the nav system, and then. Uh, and you're just meditating. Home. Oh, yeah. Your car's just traveling. It's very. Oh, it's kind of eerie. It's kind of eerie. What did you think when you saw that video of that dude falling asleep behind the wheel? I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. The one in San Francisco. He's like right outside of San Jose. The dude's out cold like this. <laughs> And the car's in bumper to bumper traffic, moving along. <laughs> yeah, have you seen it, right? Yeah, yeah. We we, we changed the software. <laughs> we changed the software. That's I think an old video. We changed the software where if if you don't touch the wheel, it it will gradually slow down oh. and put the emergency lights on and wake you up. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah. Can you choose what voice wakes you up? Well, it's sort of more of a, it sort of honks. Oh, it honks. <laughs> yeah. This should be like wake up, fuck face. Well, You're endangering we, we, your fellow humans. We, we could we could gently wake you up with a sultry voice. Ah, uh, that would be good. Like a, so, something with a southern accent. <laughs> hey, wake up. Wake up, sunshine. Hey, sweetie. <laughs> exactly. Why don't you wake you could, up? Like, pick, you could pick your... Right, like pick Siri. Pick what you want. Yeah, I choose yes. the Australian girl for Siri. Yeah. I do, like her do, voice. Do you want it seductive? It's my favorite. What, I like Australian. What, what flavor of... Do, do you want it to be angry? It could be anything. Do you want those Australian prison lady jeans? <laughs> Now, when you um, when you program something like that in, is this in response to a concern, or is it your own? Yeah. If or do you look at it and go, "Hey, um, they shouldn't just be able to fall asleep. Let's wake them up." Yeah, yeah. We, we it's like you know we're like well, you know people are falling asleep. We we've got to do something about that. Right, but when you first released it, you didn't consider it, right? You just like, well, no one's gonna just sleep. People fall asleep in cars all the time. All the time. And crash. Yeah. At least our car horrible. doesn't crash. That's better. Yeah. It's better not to crash. Imagine yes. if that guy had fallen asleep in a, in a gasoline car. They do oh. it all the time. For sure. Yeah. And they'd be crashing somebody. Yeah. In, in fact, the thing that really, you know, got me to, it's like, man, we better get autopilot going and get it out there, was the, a guy was in an early Tesla driving down the highway and he fell asleep. And he ran over a cyclist and killed him. And it's like, I was like, man, if we had autopilot, wouldn't have run out of the, we might have fallen asleep, but at least he wouldn't have run over that cyclist. So how did you implement it? Like, did you just use cameras in, yeah. programmed with the, the, the system so that if it sees images, it slows down? And how much time do you give? Is, yeah. is the person who's in control of it allowed to program how fast it goes? Yes. Yeah, you can program it to be more or less like more conservative, or like more aggressive driver. Um, and uh, you can say what speed you want it to, what what speed is okay. I know you have ludicrous uh, mode. Do you have douchebag mode? Ha -ha. <laughs> <laughs> well, in it just cuts people off. Well. <laughs> For for lane changes, it's tricky because if you're in like L.A. 
Like unless right. you're pretty aggressive, right? It's pretty. It's hard to change lanes sometimes. You can't, it's hard to be Satnam. It's hard to be Namaste. Oh, out here in LA. Yeah. You get, if you want to hit that Santa Monica Boulevard <laughs> off ramp. I mean, you got to be a little pushy. <laughs> you got to be a little pushy. Yeah, especially when people are angry. Yeah. They're a little angry. They don't want you in. They speed up. Sometimes, Those. you know, I think people like overall are pretty nice on the highway, even in LA. But sometimes they're not. Do you think the Neuralink will help that? <laughs> Clink. Probably. Everybody be locked in together. This hive mind. Tunnels will help it. We're gonna have traffic. That'll help a lot. Yeah. How many of those can you put in there? Could nice thing about tunnels. Everybody? Nice thing about tunnels is you can go 3D. So oh, you can go right. many levels. Right. So until you hit hell. <laughs> yeah. But you could go. You could have a hundred levels of tunnel. No problems. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I don't want to be on 99. Not to be on 99th negative 99 floors. Whoo. This is one of the fundamental things people don't appreciate about t- tunnels is that it's not like roads. The fundamental issue with roads is that you have a 2D transport system and mm. a 3D living and workspace environment. So you've got all these tall buildings or, or concentrated work environments, and and then then you want to go into this like 2D transport system, which Hugely is inefficient. pretty low density because cars are per- spaced out pretty far. Um, and, and so that obviously is not going to work. Uh, you're going to have traffic guaranteed. But if you can go 3D on your transport system, then you can solve all traffic. And you can either go 3D up with a flying car or you can go 3D down with tunnels. And you can have as many tunnel levels as you want. And you can uh, arbitrarily relieve any amount of traffic. You can go further down with tunnels than you can go up with buildings. You're 10,000 feet down if you want. I wouldn't recommend it, but what was that movie with uh, what's his face? Bradley Cooper, not Bradley Cooper. Uh, Christian, no, what the fuck's his name? Batman. Like Who is Batman? Christian Bale. Christian Bale, where he they fought dragons. Him and Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> they went down deep into the earth. How high? How far, deep I don't can think you go? That was to, Batman. But yeah, it was. It was. Batman fought dragons. No, it wasn't Batman, but it was okay. Christian Bale. And Rain of Fire. Rain of Fire. Okay. You ever saw that? No. Terrible. Movie. <laughs> Terrible okay. movie, but good. Terrible, I wouldn't recommend drilling time. super far down. Yeah, like, but you get Earth real is deep, a, it gets big, hot, right? Molten. We're, yeah. Earth is a giant ball of lava mm-hmm. with a thin crust on the top, which we think of as like the surface, this thin crust. And it's mostly just a big ball of lava. That's Earth. But 10,000 feet is not a big deal. Have you given any consideration whatsoever to the flat Earth movement? <laughs> I think that's a troll situation. Oh, it's not. No, it's not. You would like to think okay. that because you're a super genius. <laughs> but I, as a normal normal person, I know there's people way dumber than me. And they really, really believe. They watch YouTube videos which go on uninterrupted and spew out a bunch of fucking fake facts very eloquently and articulately. And they really believe. These people really believe. I mean, if it works for them, sure. <laughs> fine. fine. It's weird, though, right? That in this age where, you know, there's ludicrous mode in your car, goes 1.9 seconds, 0 to 60. It's 2.2. 2.2. Which one's 1. 1.9? The Roadster? Oh, the, the next generation Roadster. Mm, okay. Standard edition. Yeah. I'm on top of this shit. Mm-hmm. That's the st- that's the, that's without standard the, edition. Yeah, so it's about the, the performance package. What uh, what, p- what performance package? Yeah. What what the fuck do you need? We're gonna put rocket thrusters <laughs> on it. For real? Yes. What are they gonna burn? Nothing. Uh, high, uh, ultra high pressure compressed air. Whoa. Just gas, air. Cold, cold gas thrusters. Now, do you have to have air tanks, or are they yeah. just sucking the air out of? Okay. Yeah, I just have an electric pump. Whoa. Pump it up to like ten thousand psi. And how fast are we talking? Zero to sixty. How fast do you want to go? I'm, I want to go. We could make it just fly. I want to go back in time. Could make it fly. You make it fly. Sure. Do you anticipate that as being? I mean, you were talking about the tunnels and then flying cars. Do you really think that's going to be real? It's too noisy and there's too much airflow. So the, the fundamental issue mm. with flying cars. I mean, if you get like one of those like toy drones, think of how much, how loud those are, and how much air that they, how much air they blow. Now imagine if that's like a thousand times heavier. Mm. This is not going to be make your neighbors happy. Your neighbors are not going to be happy if you land a flying car in your backyard. It'll be very helicopter-like. <laughs> not, 
or on your roof, they're just really going to be like, what the hell? Uh, that was annoying. Yeah. You can't even, like, if you want a flying car, just put some wheels on a helicopter. Is there a way around that? Like, what if they figure out some sort of magnetic technology, like all those Bob Lazar type characters were thinking that was a part of the UFO technology they were doing at Area 51? Remember, didn't they have some some thoughts about magnetics? Nope. No? Bullshit? Yes. Really? Yeah, there's a fundamental momentum exchange with okay. the air. So you must uh, you you must accelerate. There's there's like there's there's a certain you you have a mass and you have gravi gravitational acceleration, um, and mass mass times your mass times gravity must equal the mass of airflow times the acceleration of that airflow to have a, n a neutral force. So it's impossible MG to equals get MA, around. And then you won't move. But right. if okay. if MG is greater than MA. You will go down, and if MA is greater than MG, you will go up. Mm. <laughs> That's how it works. There's just no way around that. There is definitely no way around it. There's no way to create some sort of a magnetic something or another that allows you to. Technically, float. yes, you you could have a strong enough magnet, but that magnet would be so strong that you would create a lot of trouble. We just suck cars up into your car. Just pick up <laughs> I mean, axles you, you, and you, shit. You'd have to repel off of either uh, material on the ground or in a really nutty situation off of Earth's gravitational field and somehow make that incredibly light. But that magnet would cause so much destruction, you'd be better off with a helicopter. So if there was some sort of magnet road, like you have two magnets and they repel each other, if you had some sort of a magnet road that was below you and you could travel on that magnet road, that would work. Ha ha ha. Yes. Yes, you could yes. have a magnet road. A magnet road. <laughs> Is that too ridiculous? No, it's, it would work. Cement's you could do that. ridiculous too, right? I would not recommend it. There's a lot of things I don't recommend. I, don't <laughs> I recommend would super smoking. not recommend that. <laughs> Not good, not wise, I think. No, magnet no. roads. No, no, that, no, definitely not, definitely not. It was that would cause a lot of trouble. So you've put some time and consideration into this, other than uh, you know, instead of like my foolishly rendered thoughts. So you think that tunnels are the way to do it? Oh, it'll work for sure. That'll work. Yes. And your these. These tunnels that you're building right now, these are basically just like test versions of this ultimate idea that you have? You know, it's just a hole in the ground. Right. We played videos of it where you, just your idea is that you're going to drop that hole in the ground. There's a sled on it, and the sled goes very fast, like 100 miles an hour plus. Yeah, you can go real fast. You can go as fast as you want. And then if you want to go long distances, you can just draw the air out of the tunnel, make sure it's real straight. Draw the air out of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah, it's a vacuum tunnel. Because um, the then and then depending on how fast you want to go, you can either use wheels, or you could use air bearings depending upon the ambient pressure in the tunnel, or you could uh, maglev it if you want to go super fast. Um, so magnet road. Yes, but underground magnet roads. So underground magnet yeah, roads. Yeah, otherwise you're going to really create a lot of trouble with because those metal things. Ah, uh, so magnet road is the way to go, just underground. If you want to go really fast underground, you would be in you would be maglev in a vacuum tunnel. Mag in a vacuum tunnel. Magnetic with levitation in a vacuum tunnel. Launchers. Pardon? With rocket launchers. No, I would not recommend putting any <sighs> Come exhaust on, gas bro. in the tunnel. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying cuz then, then you're going to pump it out. Gone. Right, you'll have to pump it out. And you probably have a limited amount of air in the first place. Like, how much can you breathe? Do you have to pump oxygen into these cubicles? Are these no, you'd have a, like a pressurized pod. It'd be like a, like a little tiny underground spaceship, basically. Like an airplane. Because you have air in an airplane. It's not getting new air in. It is. It is? Yes. Do they have, like, a little <laughs> hole? Yeah, they have a pump. Really? Yeah. So it gets it from the outside? Yes. Wow, I didn't know that. And it's like, it's, the air is... Air, airplanes have it, have it easy because, they, essentially, you can... They're pretty leaky, uh, but Jesus. You, yeah, but you, <laughs> so long as the so long as the air pump is working at a decent speed, they have backup pumps. Oh, so they have like you know three pumps or four pumps or something, and uh, and then that then there's like there's an ex it, it exhausts 
through the out outflow valve and and through whatever seals are not sealing quite right. Usually the door doesn't seal quite right on a plane. So there's a bit of leakage around the door. And uh, and the, but it, the, the pumps uh, exceed the outflow rate, and then that sets the pressure in the in the cabin. Now, have you ever looked at planes and gone, I could fix this? I just don't have the yeah. time. Too busy I making have a design for a plane. You do? Yes. A better design? I mean... Probably, I think it is. Yeah. Well, who have you talked to about this? And I've talked to friends. Friends. And friends and. I'm your friend. Girlfriends and. You can tell me. <laughs> 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 what do you got? What's going on? Well, I mean, the exciting thing to do would be some sort of electric vertical takeoff and landing supersonic jet of some kind. Vertical takeoff and landing meaning no need for a runway. Just shoot up straight yes. in the air and then. Ooh. How would you do that? I mean, they do that on some military aircrafts, correct? Yes. The trick is that you have a, you have to transition to level flight, um, and then you the 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 thing that you would use for vertical take or takeoff and landing is not suitable for high speed flight. So you have two different systems. Vertical I've thought takeoff about this and quite a lot. System. I've thought about this okay. quite a lot. Um, the interesting thing about an electric plane is that you want to go as high as possible, but you need a certain energy density in the battery pack um, because you have to, up to up, overcome gravitational potential energy. Once you've overcome gravitational potential energy and you're at, 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 at a high altitude, the energy you use in cruise is very low, and then you can recapture a large part of your the gravitational potential energy on the way down. Um, so you really don't need any kind of reserve fuel, if you will, because you have the... The, the energy of height, gravitational potential energy. This is a lot of energy. So, so once you can get high, the high you, the, the, like the way to think about a plane is it's a force balance. So the force balance, so a plane that, that is not accelerating um, is, is a neutral force balance. You have the force of gravity, you have the lift force of the wings, then you've got the force of the whatever thrusting device, so the, the propeller or turbine or whatever it is, um, and you've got the resistance force of the air. Now, the higher you go, the lower the air resistance is. Air density drops exponentially, but drag increases with the square, and exponential beats a square. The higher you go, the faster you will go for the same amount of energy. And at a certain altitude, you, will, you can go supersonic, with less energy per mile, quite a lot less energy per mile, than an aircraft at 35,000 feet because it's just a force balance. I'm too stupid for this conversation. It makes sense, though. No, I'm sure it does. Now, when you think about this new idea of, of, of designing, I mean, when, when you have this idea about improving planes, mm -hmm. Are you going to bring this to somebody? Or are you just chuck well, this Well, I have around? a lot on my plate. Right. That's what I'm saying. I don't know I don't know how you do what you do now, but if you keep coming up with these, but it's got to be hard to pawn these off on someone else either. Hey, hey go do a, job, a good job with this vertical takeoff and landing system that I want to implement to regular planes. The airplane, electric airplane isn't necessary right now. Electric cars are important. We need Solar energy of... is important. St stationary storage of energy is important. These things are much more important than creating electric supersonic VTOL. Also, uh, the planes naturally, you really want that gravitational energy density for an aircraft, um, and this is improving over time. So, you know, it's, it's important that we accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. That's why electric cars, it matters whether electric cars happen sooner or later. You know, we're, we're really playing a crazy game here with the atmosphere and the yeah. oceans. We're taking vast amounts of carbon from deep underground and putting this putting this in the, in the, in the atmosphere. This is crazy. We should not do this. It's very dangerous. So we should, we should, we should accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. 
I mean, this, the bizarre thing is that obviously we're going to run out of oil in the long term. You know, we're gonna, there's only so much oil we can, we can mine and burn. It's tautological. We must have sust a sustainable energy transport and energy infrastructure in the long term. So we know that's the end point. We know that. So why run this crazy experiment where we take trillions of tons of carbon from underground and put it in the atmosphere and oceans? This is an insane experiment. It's the dumbest experiment in, in human history. Why are we doing this? It's crazy. Do you think this is a product of momentum that we started off doing this when it was just a few engines, a few hundred million gallons of fuel over the whole world, not that big of a deal, and then slowly but surely over a century it got out of control? And now it, it, it's not just our fuel, but it's also, the, I mean, it, it, fossil fuels are involved in so many different electronics, so many different items that people buy. It's just this constant desire for fossil fuels, constant need for oil, without yeah. consideration of the sustainability. You know, the, the things like oil, oil, coal, gas, it's the easy money. Right. It's, it's the easy money. So, Have you heard about clean coal? <laughs> the president's uh. been tweeting about it. It's got to be real. Clean coal, all caps. Did you see? He used all caps. Clean coal. Um, well... <laughs> You know, it's very difficult to put that CO2 back in the ground. It doesn't like being in solid form. Have it takes you thought a lot about of something energy. like that? Like some sort of a filter? Giant building-sized filter sucks carbon out of the <laughs> atmosphere? No, Is that no, possible? No, no, it doesn't. It's not possible. No? No. Nope, no. nope definitely so not. So we're fucked. No, we're not fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a quite a complex question. Right. You know, we're really just when we're to, the the more carbon we take out of the ground and add to the atmosphere, and and a lot of it gets permeated into the oceans, the more dangerous it is. Like I I don't think right now. I think we're okay right now. We can probably even add some more, but the momentum towards sustainable energy is too slow. Like the there's a vast base of industry, vast transportation system like this there's, there's two and a half billion cars and trucks in the world so and and, and the, the new car and truck production if it was a hundred percent electric that's only about a hundred million per year so it would take if you could snap your fingers and in, instantly turn all all cars and trucks electric it would still take 25 years to change the transport base to electric Makes sense because how long does a truck, a car, truck last before it goes into the junkyard and gets crushed? About twenty to twenty-five years. Is there a way to accelerate that process, like some sort of subsidies or some encouragement from the government financially? Well, the the thing that is going on right now is that there is a an inherent subsidy in any oil burning device, any any power plant or car, is fundamentally. Uh, consuming the carbon capacity of the oceans and atmosphere, or just say atmosphere for short. Um, so, like you can say, like okay, there's a certain probability of something bad happening past a certain carbon concentration in the, in the atmosphere, and so there's some uncertain number where if we put too much carbon in the atmosphere, things overheat. Uh, Oceans warm up, ice caps melt, ocean real estate becomes a lot less valuable. You know, <laughs> things are underwater. And and but it's not clear what that number is. But it's definitely you know, scientists would all it's really quite the scientific scientific consensus is overwhelming. Um overwhelming. I, I mean I don't know any serious scientists, actually zero, literally zero, who who don't think that you know that that we were, have quite a serious climate risk that we're facing, and so there's fundamentally a subsidy occurring with every fossil fuel burning thing: power plants, pl aircraft, car. Frankly, even rockets. I mean, rockets use up you know they burn they burn fuel. 
but there's just you know with rockets there's just no other way to to get to orbit unfortunately so it's the only way but with cars there's definitely a better way with electric cars and to generate the energy do so with photovoltaics because we've got a giant thermonuclear reactor in the sky called the sun it's great sort of shows up every day very reliable so if you can generate energy from solar panels stored with batteries you can have energy 24 hours a day um, and then you can you know can send it to, to the poles or near to, to the north uh, with uh, you know high voltage lines also the nor north northern parts of the, of the world tend to have a lot of hydropower as well um, but anyway, the, all, all fossil fuel powered things have an inherent subsidy, which is their consumption of the carbon capacity of the atmosphere and oceans. So people tend to think like, why, why should electric vehicles have a subsidy? But they're not taking into account that all fossil fuel burning vehicles fundamentally are subsidized by the cost, the environmental cost to Earth but nobody's paying for it. We are going to pay for it, obviously, in the future. We will pay for it. It's just not paid for now. Now, what is the bottleneck in regards to electric cars and trucks and things like that? Is it battery capacity? Yeah, we've got to scale up production. We've got to make the car compelling, make it better than gasoline or diesel cars make it more efficient in terms of like the distance it can travel yeah you got to be able to go far far enough recharge fast and your roadster you're you're anticipating 600 miles is that correct yeah yeah we, what we is have, it what yeah, is that 600 miles is that right now like have you driven one 600 miles now no or, we could totally make one right now that would do 600 miles but the, the thing is it's too expensive so it's, like the car's got much more so well, you know, just have a 200 kilowatt hour pa battery pack, and you can go 600 miles. As right, long versus as what, what do you have now? 330 mile range. So that's Three, plenty for most mile range. people. What is that in terms of kilowatts? Well, that would be for a uh, Model S uh, 100 kilowatt hour pack. We'll do about 330 miles, maybe 335. But some people have hypermiled it to 500 miles. Hi hypermiled it? What does yeah, that mean? Yeah, just like go on. 45 miles an hour or something? Yeah, they're like 30 miles an hour. It's like on level ground with, you pump the tires up really well and go on a smooth surface and and you can go for a long time. Um, but you can like definitely comfortably do 300 miles. Is there uh, any... This is fine for most people. Uh, usually 200 or 250 miles is fine. 300 miles is, you don't even think about it really. Is there any possibility that you could use solar power, that solar powered one day, especially in Los Angeles? I mean, as you said about that giant nuclear reactor a million times bigger than Earth just floating in the sky, is it possible that one day you'll be able to just power all these cars just on solar power? I mean, we don't ever have cloudy days. If we do, there's three of them. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the surface area of a car is, without making the car like really blocky, um, or having some like a G wagon, yeah, like and and just like having like a lot of surface area where like maybe like solar panels fold out or something. Like your E class, <laughs> that's what we needed. Uh, the E type, yeah, that the E uh, Jaguar E type with a giant long hood that could be a giant solar panel. Well, at the beginning of Tesla, I did want to have this like unfolding solar panel thing that you'd press a button and it would just like unfold these solar panels and like charge recharge your car in the parking lot. Ah. Yeah, we could do that, but I think it's probably better to just put that on your roof. Right. And yeah. and then it's going to just be facing the sun all the time cuz like what car otherwise your car could be in the roof? shade, you know, it could be in the shade, it could be in a garage or something right. like that. Yeah. Didn't a Fisker have that on the roof? The Fisker Karma new generation for I, th I believe it was only for the the radio. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean I think it could like recharge like 2 miles a day or something. Did you laugh when they started blowing up when they got hit with water? Do you remember what happened? They got the what? Yeah, the, when they had a a, a dealership or, or, or oh where, yeah, the Fisker Karmas were parked. Was that like that with a flood in Jersey? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. When the uh, the hurricane came in, they got overwhelmed with water and they all started exploding. This fucking great video of it. Did you watch the video? I, th I didn't watch the video, but oh, I did see. I, 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 I saw you, a picture of the ass. I'd be naked, lubed up. <laughs> 
<laughs> watch that video laugh my ass off. They all blow up. They got wet and they blew up. That's not good. Yeah, we made out battery waterproof so that doesn't happen. Smart it, it actually, move. <laughs> yeah, there was a guy in Kazakhstan that um, – I think it was Kazakhstan that he – he just boated through a tunnel, under an underwater tunnel, like a flooded tunnel, and just turned the wheels to steer and pressed the accelerator, and it just floated through the tunnel, and he wow. steered around the other cars. You're like, That's amazing. It's on the internet. What happens if your car gets a little sideways, like if you're driving in snow? Like what if you're driving, if your autopilot is on, and you're in like Denver, and it snows out, and your car gets a little sideways? Does it correct itself? Does it oh, know yeah. How We've to... got, it's got great tra- traction control. But does it know how to, like, correct? Do you know how, like, oh, when yeah. your ass end kicks sure. out, you know how to counter steer? Oh, yeah. No, it's really good. It knows how to do it? Yeah. Whoa. It's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So, like, if you're going sideways, it knows how to correct itself? It generally won't go sideways. It won't? No. Why not? <laughs> it will correct itself before it goes sideways. Even in black eyes? Yeah, you sh- this video is where you can see the car, the uh, tra- that alone. traction control system is very good. It makes you feel like Superman. It's great. <laughs> you like feel like you can like it, it will make you feel like this incredible driver. I believe it. Yeah. Now, how do you program we, we, that? We, we do our testing on like an ice lake in Sweden. Oh, really? Yeah, and like Norway and and Canada and a few other places. Porsche does a lot and, of that too. New they Zealand do, as well. They do a lot of their, they do some of their driver training school on these frozen surfaces. Mm-hmm. So you're just, you're, you're, the car's going sideways whether you like it or not, and you have to learn how to slide into corners and how to adjust. Yeah. Well, electric cars have really great traction control because the reaction time is so fast. Right. So with a, with a gasoline car, you've got a lot of latency. Uh, it takes a while for the en- the engine to react and for the you know but for elect- electric motors incredibly precise um, that's why like you can imagine like like you, if you had like a printer or something uh, you you would only you wouldn't have a gasoline engine printer that would be pretty weird um, or or like a surgical device it's going to be an electric motor on the surgical device on the printer Gasoline engines going to be just chugging away. It's not going to have the reaction time. But to an electric motor, it's operating at the millisecond level, so it can turn on tra- on and off traction if, like, within like inches of getting on the honest. Like let's say you drive a patch of ice, it'll turn traction off and then turn it on a couple inches right after the ice, like if there's a little patch of ice, because. In, in in the frame of the electric motor, you're moving incredibly slowly. You're like a snail. You're a snail. You're just moving so slowly because it's it's it it can see at a thousand frames a second. And, and so it's like say one Mississippi, it it just thought about things a thousand times. So it's realized that your wheels are not getting traction. It understands there's some slippery surface that you're driving on. Yes. And it makes adjustments. In real time. Yes. In milliseconds. Uh, that, would, that would be so much safer than a regular car. Yes. It is. Just that alone, for loved ones, you'd, you'd, you'd want them to be driving your car. Yes. The, I'm on board. The, the, uh, fuck the, motors. <laughs> Dude, fuck regular motors. The, 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 the S, X, and 3 are, have the lowest probability of injury of any cars ever tested by the U.S. government. Wow. This is... Yeah, but it's pretty funny. It's pretty crazy. Like we, you know, people still sue us. Like they'll have like some accident at sixty miles an hour, where they like twisted an ankle, and they sue. They sue. <laughs> like they'll be dead in another car. They still sue us. But that's to be expected, isn't it? It is to be expected. Do you take that into account with like the same sort of fatalistic, un- you know, undertones? Just sort of just go. Uh, you gotta just I, let it go. This is what people do. I tell you, I've got that a, is what it is. quite a lot of respect for the justice system. Judges are very smart, and they see they as like I have. So far, I've found judges to be very good at justice, because I like 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 what like, and juries are good too, like they're actually quite good. Um, you know, people. You know, you read about like occasional 
errors in the justice system. Let me tell you, most of the time, they're very good. Um, and, and like, the, you know, the guy I mentioned that who fell asleep in the car and he, he rode over a cyclist. And, you know, and, and, and that was what encouraged me to get autopilot out as soon as possible. That guy sued us. He, he sued you for falling asleep? Yes. He, he, I, I, I'm not kidding. He blamed it on the new car smell. What? Yes. He blamed him falling asleep on your new car smell. There's someone who's a I'm, lawyer. I, this is a real thing that happened. Someone there's a lawyer that thought that through in front of his laptop before he wrote that up. Yes. He got a lawyer and he sued us. And the judge was like, you, this is crazy. Stop bothering me. <laughs> no. Oh, thank God. Yes. Thank God. Thank God there's a judge out there with a brain. I tell you, judges are... <laughs> Judges are very good. Some of them. What about that judge I, I that sent those boys up up the river in Pennsylvania who was selling those kids out? You know about that story? No. Nope. Yeah, judge was selling young boys to prisons. He was uh, what? L- like literally, yeah, literally under bribes for he was. Was this an elected t- judge or a? Or, uh, he was like a, sometimes you have a judge that's like actually a politician. No, he's an elected not... judge. This is a very famous story. Okay. Um, who uh, he's in jail right now? I think for the rest of his life. And he put away, he, he would take like a, a young boy would do something like steal something from a store. Okay. And he would put him in detention for, you know, five years, something r- r- ridiculously egregious. And um, they investigated his history and they found out that he was literally being paid off. Um, was it by private prisons? Is that what the, the deal was? There was some sort of, uh, but anyway, this judge is, two judges? Two judges, Kids for Cash Scandal is what it's called. 2008, yeah. yeah. Um, Common pleas judges, so I think they are elected. And who was paying them? Oh, um. someone. It, it was proven to the point where they're in jail now that yeah. someone was paying them to uh, put more asses in the seats in these private prisons. Like a million dollar payment to put them in the youth centers yeah. builder. A system. million dollar payment. Yeah. I do think it's this private Some prisons judges. thing is creating a bad incentive. It's dark. It's right. A, yes, um, but. I mean, that judge is in prison. Mm-hmm. Um, Thank God. Yes. Uh, but I, I, for people who think perhaps the justice system consists entirely of judges like that, I want to assure no. you this is not the case. The vast majority of judges are very good. I agree. And they care about justice, and they could have made a lot more money if they wanted to be a trial lawyer. And instead, they cared about justice, and they made less money because they care about justice. And that's I, why they're judges. I feel that same way about police officers. I yes. feel like there's so <laughs> many interactions with so many different yes. people with police officers that the f- very few that stand out that are horrific, we, we tend to look at that like this is evidence that police are all corrupt. And that, I think that's crazy. No, most, most police are, 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 are very honest. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, like... The, the military have an military personnel diff- that I know of, yes. very honorable, ethical people, yes. and much more honorable and ethical than the average person. That's I my agree. impression. That is my impression as well. But and, and that's not to suggest that we, we be complacent and assume everyone's honest and ethical. And obviously, if somebody is is given a a trusted place in society, such as being a police officer or a judge, and they are corrupt, then we must be extra vigilant against such situations yes. and take action. Uh, but but we should not think that this is somehow broadly descriptive of people in that profession. I couldn't agree more. I think there's also an issue with um, one of the things that happens with police officers, prosecutors, and, and, and anyone that's trying to convict someone or arrest someone is that it becomes a game. And in games, people want to win. Yes. And sometimes people cheat. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, if, you know, if you're a prosecutor, you should not always want to win. There are times when you should like, okay... I just should not want to win this case, um, and then you know, like, just pass on that case. Sometimes people want to win too much. That is true. Um, I think also the it becomes tough if you're if you're like a district attorney. You know, it, you you tend to sort of see a lot of criminals, and then your your view of the world can get negatively. Yes. You know, have a negative. You know, you can have a negative view of the world because. You know, you're just interacting with a lot of criminals, but actually most of society is not consist of criminals. Right. Um, and I actually had this conversation at dinner several years ago with a district attorney. I was like, man, it must sometimes seem pretty, pretty dark because, you know, man, there's some, there's some terrible human beings out there. Um, and he was like, yep. And he was like dealing with some case 
which consisted of a couple of old ladies that would run people over somehow for insurance money. It was rough. I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty rough. I was like, it's, it's like hard to maintain faith in humanity if you're a district attorney, but, but you know, it's only a few percent of society that are actually bad. And then if you go to the worst, say 0.1% of society or the worst one in a thousand, one in a million, you know, like how bad is the millionth worst person in the United States? Right. Pretty damn bad, <laughs> like damn evil. Like yeah. the, the, the millionth, the, like the millionth, well, one in a million of evil is so evil, people cannot even conceive of it. But there's 330 million people in the United States, so that's 330 people out there somewhere. But on, by the same token, there's also 330 people who are incredible angels and g unbelievably good human beings. Yeah. On the but other we, side. But because of our fear of danger, we tend to, our thoughts tend to gravitate towards the worst case scenario. Yes. And we want to frame that. And it's one of the real problems with prejudice. We want whether it's prejudice towards uh, different minorities or prejudice towards police officers or anything. It's like we want to look at the worst case scenario and say this is an example of what this is all about. And you see that even with people how they frame genders. I mean, mm -hmm. Some some men frame women like that. They get r ripped off by a few women and they decide all women are evil. Some women get fucked over by a few men. All men are shit. And and this this is very toxic. And it it's, is. it's also. It's a very unbalanced way of mm -hmm. viewing the world, and it's very emotionally based, and it's based on your own experience, your own anecdotal experience, and uh, it can it can be very influential to the people around you, and it's just it's a dangerous way, it's a dangerous thought process and pattern to promote. It is. It is a very dangerous thought pattern. I, I really think, you know, people should give other people the benefit of the doubt and assume that they're good until proven otherwise. And I think really most people are actually pretty good people. Nobody's perfect. They have to be. If you think yes. of the vast numbers of us that are just interacting yeah. with, each other, with each other constantly, yeah. we have to be better than we think we are. Yes. There's, no I other, mean, like, there's no other way. I mean, here are all these weapons. Like, but how many times like nobody's presumably tried to murder you in your nobody own studio? Nobody yet. Yes, nobody's. Like, but the, now right, there's a flame the sword's right there. Fake flamethrower here. It's not, exactly. not a flamethrower. Now we've got a real problem. I'm going to put it on that side, too. I'm going to leave it for the guests. Yeah. I'm like, look, man, if I say something that fucked up, it's right there. So we'll liven things up for sure. <laughs> it's guaranteed to make any party better. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's the armed uh, civilization theory, right? That a, a, an armed uh, community is a, a safe and polite community. You ever yeah. You in Texas? It's kind of true. <laughs> yeah. I mean. People in oh. Texas are super polite and everyone's got a gun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't make somebody angry. Yeah. Don't, know, don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, it's not a good move. Yeah. Piss people off when everybody can have a gun. You're yeah. Better off to just let that guy get in your lane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we got a big uh, test site in Central Texas near oh, Waco. Yeah? Oh, beautiful. This, yeah, SpaceX uh, in McGregor. Um, it's about 15 minutes away from Waco. That's close to where Ted Nugent lives. It Shout is? out to Ted Nugent. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're... You know, we have like lots of fire and loud explosions and things, and people, I bet. they're cool with it. They don't give a fuck out there. <laughs> they're very supportive. Yeah, you can buy fireworks where, you know, your kids go to school. Yeah, it's, you know, it's dangerous. Yeah, but it's, but it's free. It's there's, free. There's something about exactly. Texas that's very enticing because of that. It is dangerous, but it's also free. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of like Texas, actually. Well, I prefer it over places that are more restrictive but more liberal because you could always be liberal like just because things are free and just because you have a certain amount of you know right wing type characters it doesn't mean you have to be that way no. you know and and honestly there's a lot of those people that are pretty fucking open minded and let you do whatever you want to do right. as long as you don't bother them yeah exactly that's my hope right now with um the way we're able to communicate with each other today and how radically different it is than generations past is that we all just, the dust settles. And we all realize, like like what you were saying, that most people are good. Most people are good. The vast majority. Yes. I think you should give people the benefit of the doubt, for sure. I think you're right. Yeah. You know what can help that? What, Mushrooms. What? <laughs> Mushrooms. 
don't you think? They're delicious. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. They're good for you, too. Yeah. All of them. All kinds of them. <laughs> um, what do you see in terms of, like, when you think about the future of your companies, what do you see as, like, bottlenecks? You want some more of this? Uh, sure. Thank you. What do you see in terms of, like, bottlenecks, of things that are, that are holding back innovation? Is it regulatory commissions and, and people that don't understand the technology that are influencing policy? Like, what, what, what could potentially be holding you guys back right now? Is there anything that you would change? Yeah, like, that's a good question. You know, I wish, I wish politicians were better at science. That would help a lot. That's a problem. Yes. There's no incentive for them to be good at science. There isn't. Um, actually, you know, they're, they're pretty good at science in China, I have to say. Are the, they? Yeah, the mayor of Beijing is, I believe, an environmental engineering degree, and the deputy mayor is a physics degree. I met them. And the uh, mayor of Shanghai is really smart and uh, you're, you're up on technology what do you think about this government policy of of stopping use of huawei phones and there's there's something about the the the, the worry about spying is i mean from what i've understand from real tech people they think it's horseshit oh i i like phones i don't know i don't know um like the government say don't you buy huawei phones is that, do you, do you, um, are you up on that at all? No? Should we just abandon yeah. this idea? Well, I, I, mean, I think, like, I guess if you're, if you're, uh, if you have, like, top secret stuff, um, then you want to be pretty careful about what hardware you use. Uh, but, you know, like, most people do not have top secret stuff. Right. And, like, nobody really cares what porn you watch, you know? Right. And, like, <laughs> or, yeah. it's like, nobody actually cares, you know? So, and if they do, that's kind of on them. Like really just like, yeah. like national spy agencies do not care, do not <laughs> give a rat's ass <laughs> what right. porn you watch. They do not care. So, like, what secrets do, does a national spy agency have to learn from the average citizen? Nothing. Well, that's the, the argument against the, the the narrative, and the argument by a lot of these tech people is that the real concern is that these companies like Huawei are innovating at a radical pace mm -hmm. and they're trying to stop them from integrating into our culture and letting this like right now they're the number two f cell phone manufacturer in the world okay samsung's number one huawei is number two apple is now number three they surpassed apple as number two and the idea is that this is all ha taking place without them having any foothold whatsoever in america there are no there's no carriers that ha have their phones you have to buy their phones unlocked through some sort of a third party and then put okay so and, and the the worry is you know that these are somehow or another controlled by the chinese government the communist chinese government is going to distribute these phones <laughs> and i don't know if it's the the worry is economic influence and that they'll have too much power i don't know what it is are you are you paying attention I, on any of this? Not really. No, I, I don't think we should worry too much about Huawei phones. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, our national security agencies shouldn't have Huawei phones. Maybe that's a question mark. Uh, but uh, I think for the average citizen, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't like no, they're not. I'm pretty sure the Chinese government does not care about the goings on of the, the average American citizen. Is there? Is there? a time where you think that there will be no security, where it will be impossible to hold back information, that whatever bottleneck will we'll let go, we're going we're gonna to give in, that whatever bottleneck between privacy and ultimate innovation will, will have to be bridged in order for us to achieve the next level of technological proficiency, that we're just going to abandon it, and there'll be no, no <laughs> security, no privacy. Uh, do people want privacy? Because they seem to put everything on the internet. Well, uh, right now they're confused. But when you're talking about your neural link and this, this idea that one day we are going to be able to share information and we're going to be some sort of a thing that's symbiotically, create, uh, symbiotically oh, I, connected. Yeah. I think we really need to worry about security in that situation. And when, For sure. That's but, like a security be paramount. Sure. Yeah. But also we, what we will be is we'll be so much different. Our, our concerns about money, 
about status, about well, all these things will, will seemingly go by the wayside if we really become enlightened, if we really become artificially enlightened by some sort of an AI interface where we have this symbiotic relationship with some new internet type connection to information. What, you know, what happens then? What, what, what is important and what is not important? Is privacy important when we're all gods? <laughs> I mean, I think the things that we think are important to keep private right now, right. we probably will not think are important. Shame, right? Information, right? What do you, what do you hide? Emotions? Yeah. What are we hiding? I mean, I think like I don't know. Maybe it's like embarrassing stuff. Right, embarrassing um, stuff. But there's actually like I think people there's like not that much that's kept private that people that is actually relevant. Right. Uh, that people would other people would actually care about. I mean, you think other people care about it, but they don't really care about it, and certainly governments don't. Well, um, some people care about it, but then it gets weird when you when it gets exposed, like Jennifer Lawrence, when all those naked pictures of her got exposed. Like I think in some ways people liked her more. They, they realized yeah. like oh, she's just a person, just a girl who likes sex and is just alive and has a boyfriend and sends them messages, and now you get to look into it, and you probably shouldn't have, but somebody let it go, and they put it online, and all right. She seems to be doing okay. She's a person. She's just you and me, and it's the same thing. She's just in some weird place where she's on a 35-foot-tall screen with music playing every time she talks. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I'm sure she's, she's like not, a, not, no, ha she's not happy about it, but, she, no. she's, but she's clearly doing fine. But once this interface is fully realized, where we really do become something far more powerful in terms of our cognitive ability or our ability to understand irrational thoughts and, and mitigate them and that we're all connected in some sort of an insane way. What I mean, how, what are what, our thoughts on wealth, our thoughts on social status, like how many of those just evaporate and our need for privacy? Maybe our need for privacy will be the ultimate bottleneck that we'll have to, subs that we'll have to surpass. I think the things that we think are important now will probably not be important in the future, but there will be things that are important. What they will just be more different things. I don't know, there might be some war of ideas, potentially. I don't think Darwin's going away. Right. Darwin's going to be there. No, Darwin, will, no, Darwin yeah. will be there forever. Forever, yeah. It will just be a different, a different arena. Different arena. A digital arena. Different arena. Darwin's not going away. What keeps you up at night? Well, it's quite hard to run companies. Yeah. Especially car companies, I have to say. It's quite challenging. The car business is the hardest one of all the things you do? Yes. Because it's a consumer-oriented business as opposed to like SpaceX and... Not that SpaceX, SpaceX is no walk in the park, but but a car company, it's very difficult to keep a car company alive. It's very difficult. You know, there's only two car companies in the history of American car companies that haven't gone bankrupt, and that's Ford and Tesla. That's it. Yeah, Ford rode out that crazy storm, huh? They're the only ones. By the skin of their teeth. Shout out to the Mustang. Yeah. Yeah, by the skin of their teeth. That is interesting, right? Same with Tesla. We barely survived. How close did you get to folding? Very close. We, uh, I mean, 2008 is not a good time to be a car company, especially a startup car company, and especially an electric car company. That was like stupidity squared. And this is when you had those cool roadsters with the T top? Yeah. With the, um, uh, target top? Yeah. We had like, uh, Use a highly modified Elise chassis. The body was all completely different. By the way, that was a super dumb strategy that we actually did. Why was we, it dumb? It was based on two false premises. Uh, one false premise was that we'd be able to uh, cheaply convert the Lotus Elise um, and use that as a car platform, and that we would be able to use technology from this little company called AC Propulsion for the electric drivetrain. 
uh, and the battery. Problem is, the AC propulsion technology did not work in production, and we ended up using none of it in the long term. None of it. We had to redesign everything. And then the once you add a battery pack and an electric motor to the car, it got heavier. It got thirty percent heavier. Invalidated the entire structure, all the crash structure. Everything had to be redone. Nothing like the, I think it had less than seven percent of the parts were common with any other device, including cars or anything. <laughs> less than seven percent. Yes. Everything, including tires and wheels, bolts, brakes. The, yeah, even every, steering wheel. See, the steering wheel was. I think the steering wheel was almost the same. <laughs> Yes, the, st- the the windscreen, the wind windscreen. Different. No, I think the windscreen is the same. Same. Yes, I think the, I think we were able to keep the less windscreen less than seven percent. So that's right. Re- basically, every body panel was different. The entire structure was different. The uh, we, we couldn't use the H like the HVAC system. The, the you know the air conditioner mm-hmm. was a belt driven air conditioner. Off, off a, oh, so now right. we needed a, something that was electrically driven. Which, we needed a new AC compressor. And all that takes away from the battery life as well, right? Yeah, we needed a, a, a small, highly efficient air conditioning system um, that fit in a tiny car and was electrically powered, not belt driven. <laughs> it was very difficult. How much did those weigh? The those cars, the Roadster. I think it was about twenty seven hundred pounds. It's still very light. Depending on which version, twenty six fifty to tw- twenty seven fifty pounds, something like that. And what was the weight distribution? Um, it was about fifty. Well, there were different versions of the car. Um, so it was about 55 on the rear. Cause it was re- rear, rear, rear bias. Right, but not bad, Like considering like a 911, which is like one of the most popular sports cars of all time, heavy rear end bias. Well, I mean, yeah. The, the 911, I think the joke is like they managed to do it despite Newton not being on their side. Yeah. If you're fighting Newton, it's very difficult. Well, it's like they, you've, you've got this... The moments of inertia on a, yeah. on a 911 are, don't make any sense. They do once you understand them. Once you, you understand, you don't how, want to hang the engine off the right. ass. This is not a wise move. You don't want to let up on the gas when you're in a corner. You, 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 the problem with a, with a, with, a, with with something that's where the engine is mounted over the rear axle or off the rear axle towards the rear is that your pull moment of inertia is fundamentally screwed. You cannot solve this. It's unsolvable. You're screwed. Right. Pull right. moment of inertia is. Screwed. You're screwed. Right. Like essentially, if you, if you spun the car like a top, that that's your polar moment of inertia. <laughs> You're just. I promise I wouldn't swear on this show. By the way. Really? Yes. To who? So it's my friend. Tell that friend to go fuck himself. Who told you not to swear? A friend. Oh, um, that's not a good friend. Yes. That Only friend I would needs swear. to realize you're fucking Elon Musk. You can do whatever you want, man. If you ever get confused, call me. I'll swear in private. <laughs> swear okay. up a storm. Just say frickin'. It's a fun way. There's like old house moms. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wives and shit that have children. Oh, this frickin' thing. Yeah. But anyway, like like the Porsche, okay. it's kind of incredible how well Porsche handles given that uh, it's the physics. Yes. The moments of inertia are, are so messed up. Uh, to actually still make it work well is is incredible. Well, if you know how to turn into the corner, once you get used to the feeling of it, there's actual benefits to it. You know, there there are some oh, benefits. I, I enjoy I the car I had before Tesla was a 911. Oh, uh, okay. That was 997 or 6. Yeah. 997. Yeah. Yeah. It's um a great car, man. Yeah, I mean, particularly with the, on the Porsche Turbo when they had the variable vanes, uh, mm. the turbo, and you didn't have the turbo lag, that was great. Yeah. That was really great. The turbo lag was is like, you know, if you floor it, like phone home, call right. your mom. <laughs> the older ones, <laughs> like, right? About an hour later, yeah. the car accelerates. And super dangerous, too, because then the real wheels start spinning. And, yeah. Yeah. There's something fun about it, though, like feeling that rear weight kicking around. You know, and again, no, it's, it's not efficient. I, it had a good feel to it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But that's that's what I was talking about earlier about that little car that I have, the ninety three nine eleven. It's just there's it's not fast. It's not it's not the best handling car, but it's more satisfying than any other car I have because it's so mechanical. It's like everything about it, like 
crackles and bumps and it gives you all this feedback and I take it to the comedy store because when I get there I feel like my brain is just popping and it's on fire it's like a strategy for me now that I, I really stop driving other cars there I drive that car there just for the brain juice just for the the, yeah. the inner the interaction I mean you should try it Model S P one hundred D. I'll try. It'll blow your mind okay. out of your skull. Okay. Yeah. You tell me what to order. I'll order it. Model S P one hundred D. Okay, Jamie. That's write the it down. that's the car that I drive. Okay. Okay, I'll get with the car you drive. Okay. It will blow your mind How out of your skull. How far can I drive? I believe you. How yeah. far can I drive? How far? About three hundred miles. That's good. For L A regular days. That's you will good. never notice the battery. Never. Never. How hard is it to get like one of them crazy plugs installed in your house? That difficult? No, it's it's super easy. It's like yeah, you, it's like a dryer plug. It's like a dryer outlet. Didn't you, know? you come up with some crazy tiles for your roof that are solar paneled? Yeah, yeah, we're I have it on my roof right now. Actually, I'm just trying it out. It's like it. The thing is, it takes a while to like test roof stuff because roofs have to last a long time. Right. So like you, you want your roof roof to last like at could least it, could thirty you put years it over and, a regular roof. Now, th so there's two versions. There's like the solar panels you put on a roof. So like depends on whether your roof's new or old. So if your roof's Roof's new. You don't want to replace the roof. You want to put like solar panels on the roof. Right. Um, so that's like retrofit, you know. And then we're trying to make the retrofit panels look real nice. Um, and then, but then the the new product we're coming out with is if if you if you have a roof that's either you're building a house or you're gonna replace your roof anyway, then you make the site the tiles uh, so have solar solar cells embedded in the tiles. Um, and then it's quite a tricky thing because you want to not see the solar cell behind the the, the glass tile. Uh, so you have to really work with the the glass and 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 the and the, the various uh, coatings and layers so that you don't see the solar cell behind the glass. Otherwise, it doesn't look right. Right. So it's really tricky. There it you, is. Jamie put it up there. Yeah. Damn, that looks good. So you, you, is there like, a uh, more? See, like if you look closely, you can see if you zoom in, like you can see the so you can see the cell. Mm -hmm. But if you zoom out, you don't see the cell. Right. Well, it looks cool See? though. Like yeah. that's that's Invisible hard. Solar that's cells. really hard because you have to have sunlight go through. Right. But when it when the, when it gets reflected back out, it doesn't it, it 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 hides the fact that there's a cell there. Now, are those available to the consumer right now? Yeah, well, we have uh, I think about those on that roof right there. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. Oh, that looks good. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. That one's hard. Oh, so you get that f kind of fake Spanish-looking thing. I like That's that. French slate. That's white people in Connecticut smoking pipes. Look at that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's badass, dude. So Those now, will actually work. I believe you. Mm. So the, 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 the solar panels that are on that house that we just looked at, is that sufficient to power the entire home? It depends on your energy, on how efficient. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So... Um, Generally, yes. I would say it's probably for most, it's going to vary, but anywhere from more than you need to uh, maybe half. Like call it half to 1.5 of the energy that you need, depending on how much roof you have relative to living space. And how ridiculous and you are with the TV. TV is no problem. Blenders, air conditioning. Air conditioning. Air conditioning, air, air conditioning oh. is, the, is the problem. If you have an efficient air conditioner... And you don't, uh, and, and depending on how, like, are you air conditioning rooms when they don't need to be air conditioned, which mm. is very common because it's right. a pain in the neck. You know, it's like programming a VCR. It's like, right. you know, it's just the blinking 12. So people just like, the hell with that. I'm just going to make it this temperature all day long. Right. Um, they don't have a smart home where if you're in the room, then it stays cool. Right. Yeah. It should predict when you're going to be home uh, and then cool the room, the rooms that you're likely to use. With a little bit of intelligence, we're not talking about like genius home here. We're just talking like elementary, basic stuff. Right. Um, you know, like if you could hook that into the car, like it knows you're coming home. Like there's no point mm. cooling the home, right. keeping the home, keeping the home, the home really cool when you're not there. Right. But it can tell that you're coming home. It's going to cool it to the right temperature. Right. Do you when have you an app there. that works with your solar panels or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, we do. And but we need to hook it into the air conditioning to really make the air conditioning work. Have you thought about creating an air conditioning system? I know you have. Trick question. 
cannot answer <laughs> questions about future potential okay, products. Okay, let's just let it go. We'll move on to the next thing. But that would be an interesting idea. <laughs> yeah, I would say. Radiant heating, all that. Good ideas. Now, when you, when you think about the efficiency of these homes and you think about implementing solar power and battery power, and is there anything else that people are missing? Is there any other? Like, I just saw a smart watch that is powered by the heat of the human body. It's some new technology. It's able to fully power that way? I don't know if it's okay. fully or if it's – like this watch right here, this is a Casio. Okay. Um, it's called a uh, ProTech, and it's in like an outdoors watch, and it's solar-powered. Okay. And so it has the ability to operate for a certain amount of time on solar. Yeah. So if you have it exposed, it could s function for a certain amount of time on solar. Yeah, well, you know um – like there's the self-winding watches where yeah. you know it's just got a weight in the watch, and as you move your wrist, the w the weight moves from one side to the other, and, and it it, w it winds the watch up. That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it's amazing that like Rolex is that it's all done mechanically. There's yeah. no batteries in there. There's no nothing. Yeah, you could do the same thing. Create a little charger that's based on uh, wrist movement. But it really depends on how much energy your watch uses. You know what's fucked up about that though? We accept a certain amount of like fuckery with those watches. Like, I brought my watch. I have a Rolex that uh, my friend Lorenzo gave me, and I brought it to um, the watch store, and uh, I said, this thing's always fast. I said, it's always, like, after a couple months, it's, like, five minutes fast. And they <laughs> go, yep. They go, yeah. Really? It's just what it does. Okay. And I go, hold on. I go, so you're telling me that it just is always going to be fast? They's like, yeah. It's just, like, every few months, you got to, like, reset it. Seems like they should recalibrate that thing. They can't. They tried. They say every few months, whether it's four months or five months or six months, it's going to be a couple of minutes fast. Okay, it seems like they should really uh, recalibrate that because you if it's always fast, you can just right. de you know delete those minutes. You need to fucking kick down the door at Rolex <laughs> and go, you bitches are lazy. <laughs> it's kind of amazing that you can keep time mechanically on a wristwatch. With these tiny little gears. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole uh, luxury watch market is fascinating. I f I'm, I'm, I'm not that involved in, in, in terms of, like, I don't buy them. I bought them as gifts, so I don't buy them for myself. But when I look at them uh, online, I mean, there's million-dollar watches out there now that are, like, they have, like, little rotating moons and yeah. stars. And they, they live, like, look at this thing. How much is that one, Jamie? Well, I don't know. I just picked one. These are fucking preposterous. I like gears. I Those love look, them. I yeah, love look, them. I think they're beautiful. But there's some of these people that are just taking it right in the ass. They're buying these watches for like $750,000. I'm like, yo, that's a Timex, son. Nobody knows. It's not any better than some Casio that you could just buy online. Like, look at that, though. Well, th here's the thing. If you're a person that doesn't just want to know the time, you want craftsmanship. You want some artisan's touch. You want innovation in terms of like a person figuring out how gears and cogs all line up perfectly to every time it turns over, it's basically a second. I mean, that's just there's there's art to that. That's yeah, it's, I agree. Yeah, it's not just telling time. I, mean, I like this watch a lot, but if it got hit by a rock, I wouldn't be sad. Yeah, it's just a watch. It's a it's a mass produced thing that runs on some quartz battery, but those things. That's, there's art yeah. to that. No, I agree. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. There's something, there's something amazing about it. It's there a, is. because it represents the human creativity. It's not just, it's not just uh, a, a electronic innovation. There's something. There's, there's a person's work in that. Yes. But you don't have a watch on. No. Ever. I used to have a watch. What happened? My, <laughs> my phone tells the time. <laughs> So. That's a good point. What if you lose your phone? Do you, are you wait? Hold on. True. Let me guess. You are a no case guy. That's correct. Ooh. Living on the edge. Living you on the edge without Neil a case. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson was in here last week. I, I marveled at his ability to get through life without a case. That's right. You know, he takes his phone and he flips it in between his fingers. Like like a like a, a a soldier would do with his rifle. Really? He just rolls that shit in between his fingers. Yeah. Okay. Marvelous. Wow. He says that's the reason why they do it. He said, when you look at someone who has a rifle, why would <laughs> they do that? Why would they flip it around like that? Right. So that when it goes to drop, they have it in their hand. They catch it quickly. 
So that's yeah. what he does with his phone. He's just flipping his phone around all the time. I got that in Mexico. I was hoping it holds joints. Does it do anything? It seems to no, open. It's just, it's, a it's just a hole. Good storage, store yeah. things in there. But like, try to put a joint in there, close it. You put like one, one blunt. One. <laughs> but it seems pretentious, you know? That's the idea behind it. I bought it when I was in Mexico because I figured it would be a, a good size to hold joints. Or not. So is that a joint? It's or is it a cigar? Yeah, it's no. Okay. It's um, marijuana it's inside sweet. of uh, tobacco. Oh, okay. So it's like posh pot, tobacco yeah. pot. You never had that? Yeah, I think I tried one once. Come on, man. <laughs> you probably can't because stockholders, right? I mean, it's legal, right? It's totally legal. Okay. How does that work? Do people get upset at you if you do certain things? There's uh, tobacco and marijuana in there. That's all it is. The, the combination of tobacco and marijuana is wonderful. First turned on to it by Charlie Murphy and then reignited by Dave Chappelle. There you go. Plus whiskey. Haha, <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Balances it out. I mean, alcohol, alcohol is a drug. It's been grandfathered in. Well, it's not just a drug. It's a drug that gets a bad rap. Because if you just have a little, it's great. Fine. Yeah, a little sip here and there, and you just your inhibitions are relaxed, and it shows your true self, and hopefully you're more joyous and friendly and happy, and, and everything's good. The real worry is... The people that can't handle it, like the real worry about people who can't handle cars that can go zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds or anything. Have you ever considered something that, like, imagine if one day everyone has a car that's on the same, at least technological standard as one of your cars. And everyone agrees that the smart thing to do is not just to have bumpers, but to perhaps have some sort of a magnetic repellent device something, some electromagnetic field around the cars, that as cars come close to each other, they automatically, radically decelerate because of magnets or something. Well, I mean, our cars break automatically. Break? Yeah. Yeah, when they see things. Yes. But like a physical barrier, like... Uh, well, the wheels work pretty well. The wheels do. Yeah, yeah. They work pretty well. Decelerated at, you know, 1.1 1 .1 to 1.2 Gs. That kind of thing. Is there a concern that one day all your cars will be on the road and that there'll still be regular people with regular cars 20, 30 years from now that'll get in the mix and be the, the main problem? Yeah, I think it'd be sort of like, you know, it was a time of transition where there were horses and gasoline cars on the road at the same time. It's been pretty weird. Oh, that'd be the weirdest. Yeah. I mean, horses were tricky, you know, back in uh, Manhattan had like 300,000 horses. You figure like, if a horse lives 15 years, got 20,000 horses die, dropping dead every day, or every, every year, I should say. Every year, 20,000 horses, if there's 300,000 horses in 15 year lifespan. Back in the gangs in New York days, that movie? Yeah, Dr. yeah. it's a lot of dead horses, and then you need a horse to move the horse. Right. And they'll probably get pretty, free, pretty freaked out if they have to move a dead horse. Do you think they know what's going on? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, tired. like, pretty weird. <laughs> like, no, I would imagine. Why am I dragging this dead, you know, horse around? And I'm a horse. Do I'm you, like, do yeah, you ever like stop it. and think about your role in civilization? Do you ever stop and think about your role in the culture? Because me, as a person who never met you until today, when I think of you, you know, I've always thought of you as being this weirdo super inventor dude who just somehow or another keeps coming up with new shit but there's not a lot of you out there like everybody else seems to be i mean obviously you make a lot of money and there's a lot of people that make a lot of money <laughs> you like that the clock yeah pretty this dope right great, this is a great clock yeah you want one i'll get you one sure okay done i like weird things like this oh this is the coolest it's tgt promotion what is this tgt studios tgt studios yeah yeah um, it's a, a gentleman who makes all this by hand. Yeah, it's really cool. My study is filled with weird devices. Well, get ready for another one. All right. I'm sending it your way. Cool. You want a werewolf, too? I'll hook you up. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay.
I'll okay. take one. One werewolf and one clock coming up. Do you think about your role in the culture? Because me as a person who never met you until today, I, I've always looked at you and like, wow, like, how does this guy just keep inventing shit? Like, how do you how do you keep coming up with all these new devices? And what do you ever consider how on you like I had a dream once that there was a million Teslas instead of like one Tesla. There was a million Teslas. OK, and not Chesley the car, but Nikola. Oh, yeah, sure. And that. In his day, there was a million people like him who were radically wow. innovative. It was a weird dream, man. It was so strange. And I've had it more that than once. Result in very rapid technology innovation, that's for sure. It's one of the only dreams in my life I've had more than one time. Okay. Like where I've woken wow. up and it's in the okay. same dream. I'm in the same dream. And in this dream, it's 1940s, 1950s, but... Everyone is severely advanced. There's flying blimps with like LCD screens on the side of them, and everything is bizarre and strange. And it, it stuck with me for whatever. And obviously, this is just a stupid dream, but for whatever reason, all these years that stuck with me. Like it takes one man, like Nikola Tesla, to have more than a hundred inventions that were patents. Right? I mean, he had some. It's pretty great. Pretty fucking amazing ideas yes but there was in his day there was very few people like him yeah that's true what if there was a million like what and then things would advance very quickly right but there's not Uh, a million elon musk there's one motherfucker do you think about that or you just try to not hmm I don't think, I don't think you'd necessarily want to be me. I don't think well, sure what's the worst part about you? I don't think you? people would like it that much. Well, most people wouldn't, but they can't be you. So that's like, that's like some superhero type shit. You know, you wouldn't want to be Spider Man. Rather just sleep tight in Gotham City. I hope he's out there doing his job. It's very hard to turn it off. Yeah. What's the hardest it's part? It might sound great to t- if it's Means turned sleep. on, but what if it doesn't turn off? Now, I showed you the isolation tank, and you've, you've never experienced that before. No. I think that could help you turn it off a little bit just for okay. the night. Yeah, just give you a little bit of sleep, a little bit of perspective. It's magnesium that you get from the water as well that makes you, makes you sleep easier because the water has Epsom salts in it. But maybe some sort of strategy for uh, sacrificing your uh, biological, or uh, not sacrificing, but enhancing your biological recovery time by figuring out a way, whether it's through meditation or some other ways to shut off that, that thing at night. Like you must have like a constant stream of ideas that's running through your head all the time. You getting text messages from chicks? No. Uh... I, I'm getting text messages from from, from, from friends saying, "What the hell are you doing smoking weed?" Is that bad for you? It's legal. It's government I mean, approved. It's not. You know, uh, I'm not a regular smoker of weed. How often do you smoke it? Almost never. Mm. How's I it mean, feel? it's it's. It, I don't actually notice any effect. Well, there you go. There was a time where I think it was Ram Dass or someone gave some Buddhist monk a bunch of acid. Okay. And he ate it, and it, it had no effect on him. I doubt that. I would say that too, but I've never meditated to the level that some of these people have, where they're constantly meditating all day. They don't have any material possessions, and all of their energy is, is spent trying to achieve a certain mindset. I would like to cynically deny that. I'd like to cynically say, they just fucking think the same way I do. They just hang out with flip-flops on and make weird noises. But maybe no. You know, I, I know a lot of people like weed, and that's fine. Uh, but I don't find that it is very good for productivity. For you? Not for me. Yeah, it's, I mean, I would imagine that for someone like you, it's not. Someone like you... It, it, It'd be more like a cup of coffee, right? You want to, you're a mate. Yeah, it's more like the opposite of a cup of coffee. What it's do you like? It's like a cup of coffee in reverse. Oh, weed is. Yeah. No, I'm saying you would like more, more like what would be beneficial to you would be like coffee. I like to get things done. 
I like to be useful. Um, that is one of the hardest things to do, is yeah, to be useful. When you say you like to get things done, like yes. in terms of like what like get gives done. you satisfaction, when you complete a project, when something, something that you invent comes to fruition and you see people enjoying it, that feeling. Yes, doing something useful for other people that I like doing. That's interesting, for other people. Yes. So that, do you think that that is maybe the way you recognize that you have this unusual position in the culture where you can uniquely influence certain things because of this? I mean, you essentially have a gift, right? I mean, huh. so, you, you would think it was a curse, but I'm sure it's been fueled by many, many years of discipline and, and learning, but you essentially have a gift and that you have this radical sort of creativity engine when it comes to innovation and technology. It's like you're just, you're going at a very high RPMs. All the time. What is that it like? It doesn't stop. I don't know what would happen if I got into a sensory deprivation tank. I Let's don't try know. it. It <laughs> sounds concerning. <laughs> it's like why? running the engine no. with no resistance. That seems, is that what it is, though? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's fine. I don't know. How I'll much? try it. I'll try it. Have you ever experimented, experimented with meditation or anything? Yes. What do you do? Or what have you done, rather? I mean, you just sort of sit there and be quiet and then repeat some mantra, which acts as a focal point. It does still the mind. It does still the mind. But I don't find myself drawn to it frequently. Do you think that perhaps productivity is maybe more attractive to you than enlightenment? And like, or even the concept of whatever enlightenment means. Like, what are you trying to achieve when you're meditating all the time? With, with you, it seems like almost like there's a franticness to your creativity that comes out of this, this burning furnace. And for, in order for you to, like, calm that thing down, <laughs> you, throw, you may, might have to throw too much water on it. It's like a never-ending explosion. Like, what is it like? Like, try to explain it to a dumb person like me. What's going on never in the head? Never-ending explosion. <laughs> it's just constant ideas, just bouncing around. Yes. Whew. Damn. Yeah. So when everybody leaves, it's just Elon sitting at home, brushing his teeth, it's just a bunch of ideas bouncing around your head. Yeah. Whew. All the time. When did you realize that that's not the case with most people? I think when I was, I don't know, five or six or something, I thought I was insane. Why did you think you were insane? Because it was clear that other people did not, would, their mind wasn't exploding with ideas all so the time. they weren't expressing it. They weren't talking about it all the time. And you realized by the time you were five or six, like, oh, they're probably not even getting this thing that I'm getting. No, it was just strange. It was like, hmm, I'm strange. <laughs> that was my conclusion, I'm strange. But did you feel diminished by it in any way? Like knowing that this is a weird thing that you really probably couldn't commiserate with, with other people? You, they, they wouldn't understand I hope, you? I hope they wouldn't find out because they might like put me away or something. You thought that? For a second, yes. When you like, were little? Yeah, and they put people away. What if they put me away? Like when you were little, you thought this? Yes. Wow. Like you thought this <laughs> is so radically different than the people that are around me. If they find out I got this stream coming in. Yeah. Wow. But you know, I was only like five or six. So, like, like. Do you think this is like, I mean, there's, there's outliers biologically. You mean there's people that are seven foot nine, there's people that have giant hands, there's people that have <laughs> eyes that are 2015 vision, there's always outliers. Um, do you feel like you like caught this? Like you have got some, you're like on some weird innovation, creativity sort of wave that's very unusual. Like you, you tapped into... 
I mean, just think of the, 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 the various things you've been able to accomplish in a very short amount of time. <laughs> and you're constantly doing this. That's a weird, you're a weird person, right? I, I agree. Yeah. Like, what if there's a million Elon Musks? Well, that would be very, Ooh. very weird. Woo. Yeah, it'd be pretty weird. I agree. Real weird. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. What if there are a million Joe Rogans? Oh, there probably is. <laughs> There's probably two million. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the case with a, a lot of folks. Yeah. I mean, but like, uh, you know, my goal is like try to do useful things, try to maximize the probability the future is good, um, make the future exciting, something you look forward to, you know. You know, with uh, you know, with Tesla, we're like trying to make things that people love. You know, it's like not like how many how many things can you buy that you really love that really give you joy? So rare, so rare. I wish there were more things. That's what we're trying to do: just make things that somebody loves. When you That's when you think about so making difficult. things that someone loves, like. Do you specifically think about like what things would improve people's experience? Like what what would change the way people interface with life that would make them more relaxed or more happy? You really think like when you're thinking about things like that, is that like one of your considerations? Like what what could I do that would help people that yeah. maybe they wouldn't be able to figure out? Yeah, like like what are the set of things that can be done? to make the future better. Like, you know, like, so I think that a future where we are a spacefaring civilization and out there among the stars, this is very exciting. This makes me look forward to the future. This makes me want that future. You know, the things, there need to be things that make you look forward to waking up in the morning. You wake up in the morning, you look forward to the day, look forward to the future. In a future where we are a spacefaring civilization and out there among the stars, I think that's very exciting. That is a thing we want. Whereas if if you knew we would not be a spacefaring civilization but forever confined to Earth, this would not be a good future. That would be very sad, I think. It would be we sad. Don't want the sad future. Of the, the just the, the finite lifespan of yeah. the Earth itself and the solar system itself. That even though it's possibly you know, I mean how many what, how long do they feel like this sun and the solar system is going to exist. How many hundreds of millions of years? Well, it's probably, if you're saying, the, when does the sun boil the oceans? Right. About 500 million years. So is, is it sad that we never leave because in 500 million years that happens? Is that what you're saying? No, I just think, like, there, if there are two futurists, and one futurist, we're out there among the stars, and the things we read about and see in science fiction movies, the good ones, are true. We have these starships, and we're, we, we're going to see what other planets are like. And we're a multi-planet species, and the scope and scale of consciousness has expanded across m many civilizations and many planets and many star systems. This is a great future. This is a wonderful thing to me, and that's what we should strive for. Mm. But th that's biological travel. That's cells traveling physically to another location. Yes. Do you think that's definitely where we're going? No. Yeah, I don't think so either. I used to think so, and now I'm thinking more likely less than ever. Like, almost every day, less likely. We can definitely go to the moon and Mars. Yeah. And Do you we think, think we can go colonize? to the asteroid belt and we can go to the moons of Jupiter, Saturn. We can even get to Pluto. That would be the craziest place ever if we colonized Mars and re-terraformed it and turned it into, like, a big Jamaica. <laughs> Just I think oceans. We should. And I think that would be, be I mean, imagine. Great. That would be great. It's poten there's, it's what, amazing. possible, right? We yes. could turn the whole thing into Cancun. <laughs> well, I mean, over time, it wouldn't be easy, but yes, right. It's you could just warm, you could warm it up. Yeah, you warm could warm it up. it up. You could add air. You could get some water there. 
I mean, over time, we hundreds be, of millions of years or whatever it takes. We could be a multi-planet species. Yeah, that would be amazing. We could be a if multi-planet species. That's what we want to be. Legitimately, like, air-conditioned Saturn. I'm pro-human. Me too. Yeah, me I, too. I love humanity. I think it's great. We're glad, as a robot, that you love <laughs> humans, because we, we love you too, and we don't want you to kill us and eat us. And... Uh, I mean, you know, strangely, I think a lot of people don't like humanity and see it as a blight, but I do not. Well, I think one of those, I think part of that is just they've been, you know, they've been struggling. When people struggle, they associate their struggle with other people. They never internalize their problems. They look to other people as holding them back, and people suck and fuck people, and it's just, it, you know, it's a never-ending never cycle. But not always. Again, most people... Are really good most people vast majority this may sound corny it but, does sound corny but, but, it, but love is the answer it is the answer yep yeah it is it sounds corny because we're all scared you know we're all scared of trying to love people being rejected or someone taking advantage of you because you're trying to be loving sure but if we all could just relax and love each other wouldn't hurt to have more love in the world it definitely wouldn't hurt. Yeah. It'd be great. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah. I agree, man. Like, really? How do you get to fix that? You have a love machine you're working <laughs> on? <laughs> no, but uh, probably spend more time with your friends and less time on social media. Now, deleting social media from your applications, from your phones, does that give you a 10% boost to happiness? What, was the, what do you think the percentage is? I think probably something like that, yeah. It's about yeah, right. Good ten percent. Yeah. yeah. I mean I mean the only thing I've kept is Twitter because I kinda like need some means of getting a message out, mm. you know? Right. Um well, that's about it. So far so good. Well, what's interesting with you, you you actually occasionally engage with people on Twitter. Yeah. It's what percentage of that is a good idea? <laughs> Good question. Probably ten percent, right? <laughs> it's hard. It's mostly. I think it's on balance more good than bad, but mm -hmm. there's definitely some bad. So, do you ever? Hopefully, the good outweighs the bad. Do you ever think about how odd it is, the weird feeling that you get when someone says something shitty to you on Twitter and you read it? The weird feeling. This weird little negative jolt. It's like a subjective negative jolt of energy that you don't really need to absorb, but you do anyway. Like, well, fuck this guy. Fuck him. I mean, there's a lot of negativity on Twitter. It is, but it's a weird, it's in, in its form. Like the way if you ingest it, as if you're like, you try to be like a little scientist as you're ingesting it, you're like, well, how weird is this? And I'm even getting upset at some strange person saying something mean to me. It's not even accurate. I mean, the, the a vast number of negative comments. Uh, so the vast for the vast majority, of, I just ignore them. The vast majority. Yeah. But every now and again, get drawn in. It's not good. It's not good. Make mistakes. Yes, you can make mistakes. You can we make all, some mistakes. We're all human. We can make mistakes. Yeah. It's hard, and people love it when you say something and you take it back, and they're like, "Fuck you! We saved it forever." We'll fucking screenshot that shit, bitch. You had that thought. You had that thought. You're like, well, I deleted it. Not good enough. <laughs> you had the thought. I'm better than you. I never had that thought. You had that thought, you piece of shit. Look, I saved it. I put it on my blog. You yeah, I'm not sure why people thought. think that that anyone would think that deleting a tweet makes it go away. <laughs> it's like, hello, been it's, on the internet for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's even like the Anything thing is they don't want you to be able to delete it. Because the problem is if you don't delete it and you don't believe it anymore, it's really hard to say, hey, that thing above, I don't really believe that anymore. I changed my way I, the way I view things. Yes. Because people go, well, fuck you. I already have that over there. I'm going to just take that. I'm not going to pay attention to that shit you wrote underneath it's on your, it. It's on your permanent yeah, record. it's forever, bro. Like it's high a school. tattoo. We'll yeah. put this on your permanent record. Yeah. It's like a tattoo. You keep it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's this thing where there's it's it's a there's a lack of compassion. It's a lack of compassion issue. 
people are just like intentionally shitty to each other all the time online and trying to catch me. Yeah. It's they're more trying to catch people doing something that's arrestable, like a cop trying to like get you know arrests on his his record. It's like they're trying to catch you with something more than they're logically looking at it, th thinking it's a bad thing that you've done or that it's an idea they don't agree with so much they need to insult you. They're trying to catch you. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's way easier to be mean on social media than it is to be mean in person. Yes. Way easier. Yeah. Yes. It's weird. It's it's not a normal way of human interacting. It's cheating. True. We're not supposed to be able to interact so easily with people we're not looking at. Yes. You would never do that. You'd never be so mean to somebody looking in their eyes. And if you did, you'd feel like shit. Most people. Yeah. Unless you're a sociopath, you'd feel terrible. Yes. <sighs> Elon Musk, this has been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. It really has been. It's been uh, an honor. Thank you for having me. Um, thanks for doing this, because uh, I know you don't do a lot of uh, long-form stuff like this. I hope I didn't weird you out, and I hope you don't get mad that you smoke weed. <laughs> it's I mean, not bad. It's legal. It's we're in California. This is le just as legal as this whiskey we've been drinking. Exactly. This is all good, right? Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Um, is there any message you would like to put out other than love is the answer? Because I think you really nailed it with that. No, I think, you know, I think people should be nicer to each other and give people and give give more credit to, to others and don't assume that they're mean until you know they're actually mean. You know, just it's easy to demonize people. You're usually wrong about it. People are nicer than you think. Give people more credit. I couldn't agree more. And uh, I want to thank you not just for all the crazy innovations you've come up with and your constant flow of ideas, but that you choose to spread that idea, which is it's, uh, it's very vulnerable, but it's very honest, and I, it resonates with me, and I believe it. It's I true. believe it's true, too. So thank you. You're and welcome. All you assholes out there, <laughs> be nice. Be nice, bitch. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, right. Elon. Thank you. Good night, everybody.